Okay, members, we have quorum and I call the meeting to order. You have an opportunity for the public gallery to fill. Can I advise those in the public gallery that they are welcome to use mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and that all devices are muted. They can connect to the assembly Wi-Fi, password details of which are available on the gallery rules, and it is not permitted to take photographs or record any of the meeting. Members, are we aware of any apologies? I'm Mark Spratley. Mark Spratley. Any other apologies? No. Nope. Okay then, members, in terms of chairperson's business, can I remind members uh, of the urgent oral question that the Minister answered on Monday the 9th of March. The Minister indicated that SIA is to consider contingency measures in respect of possible delays to examinations. Can I ask members if they are content for the committee to write to the Department of Education and SIA seeking information on the contingency arrangements it is making with other examining boards and exam regulators in the UK in respect of potential rescheduling of GCSEs and A-levels and other examinations. Is that agreed? Agreed. <coughs> Daniel. Uh, yep, Daniel. Yeah, absolutely, Chair. This is something that's very important. It's actually something that's burning on the brains of many teachers and principals, and in particular uh, pupils and parents, about what their arrangements are going to be, because we're hearing each and every day uh, how the concern around the spread of coronavirus mm -hmm. Uh, has increased, uh, and also the risk that it poses, particularly if we listen this morning to Good Morning Ulster, that it's not just elderly that are, will be affected by this, but also young people as well, and that's something that we need to take very seriously. And something that <coughs> the Minister in the direction of considering, because if it is the case that young people are exposed in a very severe way, judging from what we heard from a, from a medical expert this morning on live radio, I think that uh, we need to be very clear around the guidelines for how we treat examinations and also, indeed, how the daily function of schools continue. Okay, thanks, Daniel. We'll, we'll send back correspondence to the department and SIA. Clark, uh, the Minister for Education is scheduled to attend the committee next, next week, week. Uh, in relation to special educational needs and coronavirus items. Um, Certainly, I have received uh, and continue to receive a series of questions from head teachers and school leaders regarding specific matters uh, that, that can't be covered by um, the Public Health Agency website and or the Form and Commonwealth Office website. Um, so perhaps next Wednesday is going to be the, the first opportunity we have to, to, to seek a response to some of those matters, but I, I know that um, I'm not self-generating this concern from school leaders and, and head teachers that, that they do need more detailed information and guidance in, in relation to specific matters, but um, if members are content, we'll maybe submit some of those questions to the Minister in advance of next Wednesday in order to get as substantive a response from them as possible. And, and Chair, yeah, can you expand slightly on this beyond the examination period? Uh, principals have continued to tell me, even after the response to the real question that was posed by yourself, uh, mm -hmm. that they uh, are still not clear about how they handle an outbreak or what happens in the event of an outbreak in their school. Uh, if a child is presenting with symptoms, what are the measures that are be to, to be taken in that uh, situation? If a teacher is exposed to that, what happens to the teacher that's exposed to the child? There's an endless list of questions that teachers have, and principals in particular, uh, and I get the sense more so this week uh, than any of the previous weeks that principals are very, very concerned now uh, about uh, the potential for an outbreak in schools, and they feel that in the event of such that there has been no guidance whatsoever from the Education Authority because, or the Department because they continue to refer to the PHA, which in my opinion, as you have rightly stated, Chair, is insufficient to tackle some of the significant questions that are posed uh, throughout uh, our schools. Uh, so there really needs to be a, 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 a root and branch approach to this in terms of how we tackle the everyday uh, potential risks to our school children, to our teachers, to our classroom assistants, to those uh, throughout uh, the sector. And, 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 and I do think that, uh, given what we've heard today uh, and in the last 24 hours, this needs to be taken very, very seriously indeed. 
the, the minister was invited to attend today's meeting. Um, uh, we can we can hope uh, that next week will be uh, timely uh, enough to provide some of that information that school leaders continue to seek. Um, okay. Any other? But Chair, just to supplement yeah, that, ahead, is there a responsibility on the Department of Education in itself to provide the guidance or can it simply continue by referring to the Public Health Agency? I don't think that's appropriate or sufficient. And on the side of that, is there a responsibility also on the Education Authority uh, to provide clear guidance or do they simply have to wait on instruction from the Department of Education in order to provide clear, clear guidelines for our teaching workforce and for our schools and children? Uh, I think there's an onus on the Education Authority to step up here very quickly uh, in light of some of the things that we're hearing. And it's not to say that there's no examples in other countries that they could take or learn from in relation to an approach here. Uh, they need to be doing this now, not tomorrow, not in a week's time and certainly not wait, waiting for the Minister to approach this committee next week. This is something that needs to be done as a matter of absolute urgency, uh, and I think it needs to be done uh, today. Uh, I, I would be meeting with the uh, chair or the, the chief executive of the Education Authority later today, and that's something I'll be posing directly to her. <coughs> okay, uh, Karen. Yeah, from, on from what, chair. what Daniel has said um, on Monday, I'd um, inform the minister of the educational working group that has been set up in uh, Scotland, England and Wales. And the Department um, of Education in England has excellent guidance. They've actually set up a specific helpline for education, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. And I think that that's the approach that we need because as this goes on every day, it's more and more worrying. But as Daniel has highlighted here, there's more questions than there is answers um, in, in terms of how we're dealing with this. And I too think, um, uh, you know, listen day on day, by the time we get to next Wednesday, I think this will have moved on greatly. So if um, the Minister and the Department could act. Principal again rang me last night, same as people here, uh, got, has got no update yesterday. Uh, parents constantly phoning in, teachers off sick, not knowing whether they have it or not, and thinking they do have it. So um, it's, this is immediate. Yeah, I, th I think the message from the minister at, at the urgent oral on, on Monday was that schools um, ought not to close unless specifically directed to do so. But I think as members have raised the timescale and the actions required in preparation for a school closure are, are, are not something that you can necessarily turn around with short notice. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we'll continue to raise these matters with the, the Minister and the Department. Justin? Okay, uh, it's over a week ago since I raised the issue of school trips to Italy, and I was derided in this committee and in the Chamber by certain members about my concerns. Um, now I'm sad to say that that's actually, those, those concerns were very real. Um, and it's not just now about the school pupils, it's about their, their bus drivers, it's about the cleaners, it's about the cooks, it's about the parents, it's about the grandparents. The school kids can very, uh, be, will be very likely to be able to resist and get through the, the, the impacts or the effects of the virus, but it's what they bring home, home to their grandparents, home to their communities. We need a swift, urgent, contingency planning and direction and guidance from the Education Authority, and the Minister should be here answering questions to tell us what, what, what directions or what, what actions are being taken which are going to save lives. It's fundamentally about saving lives, and it's not, it's, not, it's not acceptable anymore for the Minister to say, look at the, the um, Public Health Agency website, look at the Common and Foreign Health Office website. That's not acceptable for the Minister to do in this uh, crisis, which, we're, we're, which is imminent and we need to, to address and tackle right now. And just to supplement the point, uh, we, we have to appreciate, and this is by no means a political point that I would be making, we live on a small island uh, and it is connected throughout. Uh, and my question that, uh, that, we, that this committee should pose to the Minister is what uh, conversations has he had or what engagements he had with the Minister for Education in the south of this island in relation to the approach that has been taken to schools there. And also uh, the significant amount of funding that I have noted that Leo Bradker has released this week in order to support schools. Because amongst all the conversation that we are having, I have not heard a single penny been put uh, towards tackling this uh, uh, significant and serious issue. But, like, what happens in the event that a school is contaminated? Who fits the bill for the deep clean of that school? If that is to continue in and out, who fits the bill for the cover of staff if staff go off sick? 
These are all burning questions that need to be asked, but I do think that we need to be operating, whilst I appreciate that COBRA has met and I appreciate that there is a UK-wide action plan, there needs to be, in the interest of this island, an all-island action plan to deal with this, because there's people travelling in transition in a very easy way right across this island, and that relates not just to the Department of Education but other departments as well. And I think we need to make that point very, very heavily, Chair. Particularly if you take my constituency in Straban, borders in Lifford, you can freely roam across the border uh, and in other areas. So I, I think that there needs to be. And remember that this virus doesn't recognise borders. There needs to be an all-island approach to this, and I think that the executive here need to work very strongly with the Irish government in order to ensure the protection and well-being uh, of our of our children, but our people generally as well. Okay, members, um, I acknowledge that the minister did attend the urgent oral question on Monday, but I, I do think it is regrettable that it was impossible for him to attend the committee this morning. I understand diary arrangements didn't permit him to do so. Um, but there are a number of outstanding questions there that we will send to the committee in writing and that we will hope to have answered comprehensively next next Wednesday's committee then. Okay, members? Okay. Next item then, members, is post-primary transfer. Uh, can I advise members that uh, correspondence from parents and schools regarding post-primary transfer examination arrangements have been received? Mm -hmm. And can I seek agreement for the committee to invite GL, PPTC, AQE to give uh, oral evidence to the committee regarding current examination arrangements? Agreed? Agreed. Uh, as Chris, just yeah. Deputy Chair. <clears throat> These are unregulated tests. Yeah. The Department of Education has no role, so mm -hmm. I'm not sure what role the committee will have. So mm -hmm. I'm just putting that out there. And I don't know what the issues are either. No, I think, it is. I think that, that is part of it. I think when parents have concerns or questions, there are, is challenge seeking responses and accountability from the bodies setting tests and the uh, particular provision that is being used. Um, I think as a, as a committee, if we can assist with interaction with those organisations and bodies, then that, that would be my intention. Yeah. I think it'd be important, Chair. Um, it, 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 I should, I should emphasise briefly, uh, Deputy Chair, I, I have no intention in so doing as in somehow uh, uh, extending a, a, a position of the committee in relation to the use of the tests or otherwise, as you said, from a, a Northern Ireland Executive departmental point of view. Um, they are not tests set by the executive or the department, content to make that clear, but they are tests that are being set and administered by the bodies that we intend to invite to seek some accountability around those arrangements. Um, uh, and I, my personal position in relation to the, and party position in relation to the, the use of the tests has been well made, but I, I'll not use my position as chair today to re-emphasise that. Any other comments? Yeah. Just on that, I think it, uh, it's one of those complicated positions. We, we hold personal views, um, we, but we still maybe counterintuitively do something different with our kids as I did. Um, but the ownership of it, the improvement of it, the measurability of it, the sustainability of it is, is, is and we need to bottom down so the parents fully understand. Uh, and, and, and system improvements. So we have what we have. The, the minister's made it clear he intends to continue with academic selection at that stage. That being the case, then, if that's what we're faced with, how do we improve it? And how do we help parents understand better the system and protect our, our kids, as, even as a, a step in late to the meeting, um, in terms of the, the coronavirus at the minute? Yeah. The test is always with us at the minute, so therefore it should get our attention. It, it does perhaps <coughs> emphasise, and I'll, I'll, I'll seek a, a particular agenda item at a, at a next meeting to do so, but there, there is existing terms of reference for a potential committee inquiry into post-primary transfer, which might be a more comprehensive, robust way to approach the matter. Um, keen as an initial action, though, to invite those organisations to the committee, um, because I don't think the public hear from those organisations who are administering the tests or from the concern that is being raised with me um, feel like there is a robust opportunity to engage with them around the tests either 
in no way set in a committee position on the use of those tests because as you say the Department of Education position in relation to the tests is that is they don't they, they don't sit or they don't set tests for post primary transfer. But um, perhaps I, I'll reissue terms of reference for the previous inquiry that was agreed by the committee in order to see if we could move to a, agreeing a similar inquiry in, in due course. Members content? Yep. Okay. Okay, members, <coughs> next week's meeting will be in the Senate chamber at 9.45 a.m. The first briefing will be from the Minister on SEN statementing issues and coronavirus response. This will be followed at 11.30 a.m. by a joint meeting with the Committee for the Economy when members will be briefed by the Department of Education and the Department of the Economy on the 14 to 19 strategy. Okay. Okay, members, uh, next item then is draft minutes. Can I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 4th of March at page 6 and seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings? Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Members, there are no matters arising. Um, can I also remind uh, members that matters, matters arising refer exclusively to issues that were covered at previous committee meeting and may have come to light in the intervening period. Uh, if members want to raise any other issues, they can do so via uh, any other business. Can I, can any, I, any, yeah, can Deputy I Chair, go ahead. I don't know why I'm doing it right. Sorry, yeah. I got told off last week. You get told off. I might get told off this week. 2.2 .2 in the minutes. I um, uh, just want to raise uh, that on the 5th of February, when we were made aware of the new approach by the Minister in regards to information coming forward, it was not my understanding that we were not going to follow up and carry out any action. I believed we were going to write to the Minister. So uh, it is not something that myself and Catherine would agree in terms of no action. I thought we were seeking clarity. Yeah, so just, just to review that then, Clark, as it stands, the Department of Education require, you can correct me in my use of terminology here, there's no intention to be in any way um, inaccurate, but the Department of Education require the Education Authority to send correspondence for this committee to the department for consideration before it comes to this committee? Uh, I think, Chairperson, as the minutes indicate, the committee has written to the minister seeking an explanation of the arrangements in respect of um, correspondence coming from the Education Authority <coughs> destined for the committee and um, going for clearance um, through the department. So um, I think the member thought we'd agreed to do that previously, mm -hmm. but we most assuredly did agree at the last meeting to write to the minister about it. So that's okay. The minister, do we have a response yet, Claire? Not yet. Okay. Can we agree to send further correspondence, emphasising the desire for an urgent response on this matter? Because mm -hmm. I do think there is significant discontent with the arrangement. We do. Right. Okay. So the well, hopefully we receive a response in advance of the Minister coming next week. If we don't, we can raise it direct with the Minister then. Uh, members, uh, am I correct in assessing that there is a, a reasonable amount of discontent with the arrangement? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, we can seek response and follow that up with the Minister directly. Okay, okay members. Okay, members, agenda item five then is our oral briefing with regards to special schools from the Education Authority and the Strategic Leadership Group. Can I refer members to the clerk's cover note on special schools at page 14, the Education Authority and Strategic Leadership Group briefing paper at page 25, a copy of the draft equality impact assessment on the proposed framework on future provision for children in early years with special educational needs at page 34 and an ETI report from 2013 on meeting the needs of pupils with challenging behaviour in special schools at page 81. Can I welcome uh, our officials today um, and our strategic leadership group representatives. We have Ms Paula Jordan, Principal of Sparrowview Special School and the strategic leadership group. Ms Barbara Spence, Principal of Brookfield Special School and the strategic leadership group. Ms Sharon Tennant, Principal of Sandalford Special School and the Strategic Leadership Group, and Ms Kim Scott, Assistant Director of the Education Assistant Director of Education at the Education Authority. 
Can I, I welcome you to the Assembly Committee today. In the previous mandate, uh, I served as Deputy Chairperson of the Committee. We spent a considerable amount of time considering matters relating to special education and special schools, including preschool provision. The changing profile of pupils generally and the wider issues relating to constituency and continuity for special school placements for children and young people from 3 to 19. On behalf of the committee, I am therefore very uh, glad to welcome you here today and would invite you to make a presentation of no more than 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, members, for this opportunity to meet with you this morning. I look forward to working with the committee to address the many issues and challenges currently facing uh, special schools. The EA's vision is to inspire, support and challenge all our children and young people to be the best that they can be. And I would like to begin by paying tribute to the work of governors, school leaders, teachers, support staff and multidisciplinary staff across our special schools who turn this vision into a reality every day, providing high quality services to our children and young people, often in very challenging circumstances. Special schools have been recognised for their excellence across a range of accredited programmes, including the Rights Respecting Schools programme and Nurture programmes. And there are many superb achievements across the pupil population, demonstrating the commitment and investment in individual pupil capabilities and talents, and providing these pupils with the best educational start in life, enabling progressive independence and optimising their personal educational and life outcomes. The EA is suitably proud of the many achievements of this sector. Equally, the ETI inspection outcomes for the sector are consistently good and, in many cases, outstanding. There are currently 40 special schools across Northern Ireland, and these schools currently support the special educational needs of 6,170 children and young people, including those with the most severe and complex learning needs. Children are placed by the EA in a special school as a result of a statement of special educational needs, which outlines the specialist provision required to meet their assessed need. To set the special school population in context, the DE census data for 2018-19 indicates that Northern Ireland has approximately 347,000 pupils enrolled in our schools. And of this number, approximately 18,500 have a statement of special educational needs. And this represents 5.3% of our total population. And there's approximately 11,000 children with the statements of special educational needs that attend mainstream schools with additional support or specialist classes attached. And then we have approximately 6,000 children enrolled in special schools. The 1819 census data further indicates that pupil enrolment in special schools has risen by approximately 18% since the establishment of the EA in 2015. Alongside this pupil growth, there is an emerging trend relating to the increase in the complexity of pupil needs in those who require a special school placement. And this has a direct impact on the sizes of classes as reduced pupil adult ratios are required in many of these circumstances, and thus this puts considerable pressure on our school estate. Over the same period, there has been a rise of over 22% in pupils presenting and assessed with very significant intellectual or cognitive impairment, and this has been a contributing factor in the increased demand for special school places in some areas. This is further compounded by an increasing number of pupils with complex interaction of need, including very complex medical needs, where the comorbidity of assessed need can present a range of challenges. We've been acutely aware of the need to respond to the changing profile of our pupils through our capital investment programmes, and significant improvements in accommodation have recently been or are being made in planning through the Department of Education's major capital works programme and its school enhancement programme. And we value the collaborative arrangements with the Department of Education in this regard. Despite this, we continue to struggle to meet projected accommodation needs in a timely manner, often due to limitations set through capital planning processes and approvals. And we can use the EA's minor capital works budget where possible. And this is assisted with a range of improvements, such as the internal reconfiguration of existing school footprint, provision of additional modular accommodation, and or minor works to meet specific and individualised pupil needs. <coughs> Expenditure on special schools continues to rise, and it's increased from 100.8 million in 1617 
to a projected spend in 1920 of 119.7 million. And this increase in expenditure reflects the factors I've previously mentioned, including growth in pupil population, the increasing complexity of assessed need, and the resulting impact on teaching and non-teaching staffing allocations to schools. The increase in staffing allocations has been the main financial pressure, with an additional 44 and a half full-time equivalent teachers and 163 and a half full-time equivalent classroom assistants approved since the establishment of the EA in 2015. The budgetary delegation to special schools varies from the funding arrangements for mainstream schools, staffing costs in special schools as a cost to the EA at centre and is described as non-delegated funding. The total funding allocated to special school budgets is termed delegated funding and this allocation to schools to fund non-staffing costs incurred by each special schools is the responsibility of the boards of governors and the principal and they manage this on a day-to-day -day basis. The EA recognised the importance of children and young people with special educational needs attending a school close to where they live with the potential for their needs to be met from 3 to 19 years. Currently half of all our special schools in Northern Ireland are already working to this common structure and remit in relation to pupils with severe and complex needs across the age spectrum. However, we recognise there are areas for improvement in this regard and appreciate the challenges in terms of pupil growth and need and the need for equality of opportunity across Northern Ireland. We're committed to working in partnership with stakeholders and engaging with pupils, parents, staff and governors as part of our strategic approach to area planning for special schools, with the aim of securing the best possible provision for children and young people with a range of special educational needs. No change to provision will be proposed without extensive engagement with all concerned and the necessary robust consultation which is part of the area planning process. We value the relationships we have with our special school principals, teachers, boards of governors, parents and other partners and are committed to improving the experiences of children and their parents as they access special school provision across the region. Thank you, Chair, and I'm happy to take questions from members. Okay. Thank you. Right. Would any of the strategic leadership group like to make initial comments? Um, I suppose the first thing that we would like to comment on is the fact that we're delighted at being now under the Education Directorate. Um, we feel this is something that's very important to us um, because previously we sat under CYPS and it felt a bit like going back into the past when special schools were under health instead of under education. And we all felt, as a group of principals, that we should be under education the same as every other school. And we're delighted now to be working under the Education Directorate. And we would be in agreement with everything Kim has said this morning. Okay, thank you. Is, <clears throat> is that a, a temporary or a permanent designation now, Kim? It's currently a temporary designation. Okay. So we, we, we'll see how things pan out moving forward, but at the moment it's a temporary, uh, it's a temporary change. Okay. Would any of the principals like to make any further initial comments? We would hope it is permanent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the popular temporary change. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 think we, I think we've gathered that, yeah, absolutely, okay. from our, from our <laughs> principal colleagues. Are you happy to try to make comments via questions then? Yes. Principal yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. The briefing papers that have been provided to the committee show that the demand for special school places has increased by about 20%, from about 5,000 to about 6,000 since 2014-15. Um, and that the number of children with severe learning difficulties, including a complex interaction of need, has significantly increased by about 500. Uh, Kim, can I ask how this, uh, and principals as well, can I ask how this increase in pupil complexity of needs and increased numbers has affected special schools? I think maybe if, if I start by, by saying yes in my opening statement, I've said that there is a, an absolute increase in complexity of need for, for a range of reasons. And special schools in the past were designated as moderate learning difficulty and severe learning difficulty. So the child's assessed need in terms of their statement determined where the school, uh, where the child has been placed. It's been very evident as the complex needs are increasing, um, as we've pointed out, that we need to look more at designating schools that are 
requiring a cell day and indeed profound um, learning difficulties as well, so that we can educate our moderate learning difficulties children in mainstream with support or in specialist units as much as we can. So we have seen um, I suppose a shift in terms of the, of the profile of child in special school uh, as a result of that and we are working very closely in partnership and asking a lot of our special school staff to take these children in. Alongside that of course comes changes in accommodation, comes changes in terms of the specialist supports that those children need <coughs> and changes in terms of the staffing that we have with children and indeed the, the, the ratio of staffing and that then adds to the, the issue around our financial pressure on ensuring that we have the staff to cover these children. So I suppose that's just a, an initial um, outline of some of the ways that those children are impacting our special school estate. But I'm happy maybe to pass over to my colleagues to tell you a little bit more about what that looks like on the ground. Yeah, before, before I give you that opportunity, that, so, so that is known. So the, the increased complexity, mm -hmm. um, the, the need to adjust school des designations, the need for enhanced uh, health uh, provision and support um, is all there. What's taken so long to respond to it? We are responding to it, and um, we are responding to it on a on a weekly basis in terms of how we how we put each individual child into school because it's responded to on an individual basis. I think from a strategic perspective, we'll respond to it more through the area planning process, and I'm happy to happy to pick that up um, okay. afterwards. So so yeah, we, we respond to it as we go. I, I bring the principals in that point. Perhaps I can rephrase that. The the feedback that I'm getting from principals across Belfast, across Northern Ireland, is that those developments are not being responded to adequately. Um, perhaps, uh, perhaps it's an opportunity to bring the principals in at that point um, as well. Could I, I, I'm a principal of what was historically a moderate dif learning difficulty school um, and it's 3 to 11 years at the moment of age. Um, we're seeing a, a huge difference in the children who are coming into our nursery provision and, and foundation stage provision most of them having significant or severe learning difficulty. But the children towards the middle and the top of our school are mostly moderate learning difficulty, now with other comorbidities, autism and, and ADHD and so on and so forth. Um, but we are now seeing a huge change in the type of child we're having to make provision for. But the big, I suppose, pressure on us is that for the children who have moderate learning difficulties and need taught in a slightly different way to the SLD children, and need different provision. The infrastructure in the mainstreams is not there. Uh, learning support classes, units, as some people refer to them, um, we don't feel are there in the, um, the amount that they should be to allow our children who could access a mainstream provision or could access it with support uh, are there. And it's almost all of this has happened without the infrastructure being in place first. That, that's where our frustrations are. Um, and speaking for moderate learning difficulty colleagues, um, colleagues of learning uh, MLD schools. Um, I think we're all in the same boat. You know, the, the SLD children are coming through our early years. We've always had um, SLD type children, but not to the level of the numbers we have now. Um, so we're, we're trying to be everything to everybody at the moment. And it's very, very difficult, very difficult indeed. Within the SLD sector, and I know uh, Paula would be in the same position as ourselves, I come from Sandleford School, and I went to school in 2003-04, and the school was already, it, had, it was only two years, um, it had been built two years before, and we were already 20 children over the number. Um, it was built for 116. I now have 220. So that's more than a 20% increase. Um, and one of the difficulties that we perceive is that um, the accommodation needs are not met in a timely enough fashion for the increase in pupil numbers. So you would find that at the end of a year, you could be getting more children in than you have class spaces for. And like my colleagues here and colleagues throughout the north of Ireland, we are using specialist rooms as classrooms. We are using, in my case, uh, physiotherapy rooms as classrooms, stores as classrooms. And um, the way that um, funding works for additional accommodation in minor works and then in something like SEP, there's always a time lag with the additional pupils you're getting in. Plus, what we also need to look at in terms of accommodation is um, the fact that 
our perception and what we've been told is there's no schedule of accommodation for special schools. And this is a real problem when you're sitting down with uh, property services or the department to look at what exactly you need in terms of accommodation. There's plenty of research evidence on the nature of needs coming in, um, the complexity of the pupils' needs, the very different sensory processing differences and difficulties that our young people have, the nature of the pupils with autism, how that's more complex mm -hmm. these days, communication issues, the need for multidisciplinary support, and all of these structures need to be built into the new accommodation. We need to have breakout rooms, we need to have chill rooms, we need to have sensory spaces, we need to have corridors that are wide enough to allow sensory movement breaks. So we really need to come and peel this right back and say, how do we plan for a special school? I'm in the middle of an SEP um, project. School enhancement programme. School yeah. enhancement. Yeah. And we've spent 18 months trying to agree the number of rooms and what the schedule of accommodation should be. And that to me is frustrating. I've had um, four uh, temporary classrooms and three builds in the period of time I've been in Sandalford. And each time we sit down and we try to figure out with the pupil at the centre, what are the pupil's needs and how do we plan for those pupil's needs? not how we try to fit into a secondary schedule of accommodation or a primary, because that just doesn't work. So, uh, Sharon, did I hear you right there? You said that you had to educate uh, special school pupils in a storeroom? Um, <clears throat> it would be an OT store in the past, um, which I was very fortunate I worked with the North Eastern Board at the time. We were given so many additional children at the end of the year, one year, and I worked with the board's architect and we changed that room into a teach, an ASD room for five pupils. And we knocked through during the summer into an OT store. So the OTs now no longer have specific accommodation within our school. And we're talking about a school that needs to have multidisciplinary partner working. So that needs to be built into any accommodation uh, schedule. And unfortunately, what, type, the type of, uh, what type of material would, be, would have been kept in the OT store and, and what well, was the impact of losing um, that facility? The OTs would have had uh, maybe chairs and very specialist OT equipment. Okay. Um, and that's another thing about the schedule of accommodation for special schools. There needs to be an understanding that our pupils need very specialist equipment, which is quite large. Mm -hmm. You know, a standing frame could be five and a half feet. Yeah. Um, and an ordinary store designed for a special, or for a primary school or a secondary school just doesn't cut the mustard, I'm afraid. You need two stores in a special school. You need a store for specialist equipment and then you need an ordinary teacher's store where they store the materials. And even at that, when we're talking about the materials for a special school, um, and both MLD, SLD, profound learning difficulties children, um, children with uh, physical needs, you need a lot of sensory equipment. We're talking about uh, play right up through the school and very, large equipment it's no longer just in a small box as it would be in a secondary school so you've, so you you've need had two stores four temporary classrooms and three builds when you say builds is it that type of reconfiguration that you're referring to we have no because what we also have done in sandalford is worked with the northeastern board to change some of our toilet accommodation into hygiene rooms because when I went to school, certainly there were no hoists in the building. There was just manual hoists. And there's an issue with manual hoisting, as uh, my colleagues would agree, I'm sure. Um, so we had uh, four hygiene rooms built and we reconfigured the school to, to put in hygiene rooms so that the needs, the physical uh, and intimate care needs of those pupils could be looked at and, and met in an appropriate way. 
Well, would you like to add um, to accommodation issues? Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of the special schools, particularly the S schools, are meeting the same issues. Absolutely. Um, I currently, the, the school that I'm in has increased by more than three times in their numbers of pupils um, in the 23 years that I have been there. Um, we have had two additional builds where there have been um, mobiles put in place in one situation and in another they have actually built more permanent classrooms. Um, we are part of the SEP programme as well at the moment. However, the site that we are sitting on is saturated. There is nowhere else to build. So EA are having to look at purchasing additional land nearby to try and create some further build. But in the meantime... In a split, I, set, split site format? No, no, it is actually right Jason. just across the okay. fence. So that would be good. But at the moment we have a class in our PE hall, which means I no longer have a PE hall. So we can't provide statutory PE at this time of year. We can in the in the good weather when we're able to get outside, but not in the winter time. We have a class in our staff room, which means that our staff are now having their tea in a corridor outside a toilet. Um, we have a class in a medical room. Other schools have classes in uh, potting sheds, in, as Sharon has said, in storerooms. Um, I have two cloakrooms at the moment, which have just been knocked into one room to create an extra classroom and it's great that we're getting that space but we need it now um, but unfortunately everything takes planning and mm -hmm. it has to go through the proper procedures in order for the bills to take place but the children are coming through now in the last five years the profile of our children both in s and in m has changed significantly um, and we are seeing the children have much more complex medical needs, as we've talked about. Their comorbidities have increased greatly. Children with very severe challenging behaviour, with the result that we need sometimes bigger classrooms, but actually with smaller numbers of children in them. As Sharon talked about, we need the breakout spaces, but we also need outdoor space because a lot of these children, most of our children, need time outside to allow them to calm and to self-regulate in order to be able to come in and sit and be educated. So it's all of those things put together. No one could have foreseen, I, I don't, don't believe anybody could have foreseen that all of this <coughs> would happen so quickly. But medical advances have also meant that our children with profound and complex medical needs are now coming into school and surviving until adulthood where previously many of these children didn't even make it to school. Absolutely. But the medical advances mean that they are now with us and with us right throughout their school career. Mm -hmm. And again, those children need bigger spaces because they have all of the stamp frames, side lion boards, they have beds that they need to use within school. Um, they have We have oxygen in the classes. Mm -hmm. And you, again, you need smaller numbers of children because of the amount of equipment that we have. Um, and because they have, these children obviously need one to one for everything that they're doing. So all of these things are adding together mm -hmm. to complicate the whole situation with accommodation. Kim, th this description of a, an, an unfit special school estate appears to be consistent with the ETI report from 2016 to 18, which stated that overall in most special schools inspected, accommodation is insufficient given the rise in numbers and the challenging and changing profile of the pupils. I, I, I appreciate that the responsibility to respond to this is both the Department of Education and the Education Authority, but from the Education Authority perspective, can you advise how such a situation has come to pass that accommodation so clearly fails to meet the needs of, of pupils and what immediate action is being taken? My, certainly, absolutely, and, and, and thank you to my colleagues for outlining that uh, so eloquently in terms of what they're facing day to day. Right across our school estate, you know, across our 1,100 schools, we have severe accommodation issues. We have to say that health and safety is our prime concern, and we will ensure with all of our schools that our accommodation issues do not move over into this being a health and safety issue for any people attending the school. That said, right across our school estate, we have a number of schools that absolutely need new bills, significant changes to accommodation, and we are working to try to support all of our schools as we do that. 
I think from a special school perspective, we are working very closely with the department in terms of trying to meet the changing needs for the accommodation. We do that through our minor capital works um, programme, as I've talked about in terms of changing rooms and, uh, and making different spaces. We do it through the school enhancement programme with the department, and we have been very fortunate in the last two calls that 14 uh, of our schools have now been on that programme or part of that programme and are getting significant changes made. And we do it through our major capital works programme as well. We have four schools, um, two that are completed um, and, and two that are uh, going through completion at the moment. So yes, absolutely, this is a challenge. It's a challenge right across our school estate, but we are doing everything we can with the budget envelope that we have right across the system to, to do the best we can for our children and young people. Have you made bids for additional budget with regards to special school capital investment? Well, the, the, the major works programme and the school enhanced programme is how we bid for, for the monies, and we have been very successful with our special schools in particular, um, more so, I would say, than our mainstream in that, in that respect, uh, just so that we can meet the needs of those children that are attending special. Okay. Um, if I could make a, a, a comment, we are delighted that we are part of the school enhancement yeah. um, programme, and I know yeah, all we the are special well. schools are. One of the things, but that has been uh, is a comment that we would like to make about that um, is that that program and my understanding is it is to replace accommodation that isn't there at the moment. It's not for additional. Mm -hmm. accommodation. I think I'm right in saying that. And one of the problems within my setting is we have used health um, multidisciplinary areas um, as classrooms and no matter what way we look at school enhancement, we cannot put back those health mm -hmm. areas. I cannot get a physiotherapy suite or a speech therapy suite or um, you know, OT spaces through school enhancement. And maybe that's something that the committee could look at. Um, you know, that narrowing, and it's great to get the money, don't get me wrong, we are delighted, but maybe somebody needs to look at um, this is a special school and therefore these type of resources are needed in a special school. Yeah, we, we certainly will look at and something that we that maybe the Education Authority and the Department of Education with responsibility for providing you with schools can look at as well. Um, maybe, but include health yes. within that. Yeah, of course. And, um, I come from a very simple perspective about um, funding. Can there not be joint mm -hmm. funding? I don't know how funding works from the Assembly. Um, I just deal with school funds. Yeah. But, well, you know, in my mind, if if multidisciplinary partners are using the school and you know they're part of the offices there they have offices they have facility is that something that the department of health can feed into from their budget well all government departments have a statutory duty to cooperate to advance the well-being of children and young people so we can certainly explore what level of cooperation but is occurring right. between well, health and education to ensure that special schools are not converting multidisciplinary areas into classrooms. Um, before I go to, to members, uh, what, what, you, what we're hearing today is <coughs> consistent with concerns that I've been receiving, that our special schools estate is significantly over enrolment capacity, under resource uh, in unfit accommodation for increasingly complex special educational needs with inadequate <coughs> multidisciplinary team support in terms of behavioural support, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy and physiotherapy and it is concerning to hear further details today with regards to how we're asking special schools to adjust their accommodation to respond to those challenges rather than adequately area plan to provide them with the accommodation they need. Before I move to members, Kim, obviously the Belfast <coughs> Special Schools area planning appears to have effectively stalled further to parental and uh, school objection to the way it was previously handled. Can, can you provide a, an update with regards to the status of but the Belfast Special School Area Planning Process? Yep, certainly. Uh, if I can maybe, maybe just bring uh, members back to really where, where this has come from. So there has been a review, a strategic review um, of special school uh, area planning. And through that review, 
There were, and, and it was a, a ministerial-led review, there were a number of recommendations that came out of that, six recommendations um, pertaining to special schools in terms of area planning. Those recommendations then were taken forward into the strategic plan. The 20 Sorry, can I just talk, pause you for one second? A, a ministerial review was yeah, undertaken. Ministerial led review, yes, yes, yes. Special school area special planning. Special school area planning. Okay, yes. and when was that commenced? Uh, Twenty fifteen. Okay. Uh, so, so it was on the back of that that the proposals in and around consistent provision across our sorry, special schools. Sorry, Kim, to interrupt you. You said there were six recommendations. Did you say? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So on the back of that, those proposals, uh, those recommendations, look at a consistent offer for special school provision right across Northern Ireland. So that ensured that when a young people needs to be, or a, a child or young person needs to be placed in a special school, that they can attend their nearest special school where possible. So that consistent provision, uh, a preschool um, provision to be offered in all special schools, a three to nineteen, looking at the scope of special schools being three to nineteen, therefore having to, you know, being able to cut down on the transition uh, of children um, across the different phases of education um, and that children should be able to, where possible, attend their closest school. Those recommendations rolled forward into the strategic area plan, which included the Belfast schools that you refer to, and work started in terms of meeting with principals, boards of governors and stakeholders around those Belfast schools in spring of 2018. It became very apparent as the case for change was being drawn up in terms of some of the options for those schools that there was a lot of disagreement that was coming back from parents in terms of the plans. Um, and so at that point, um, it was right that we stopped and took a look at what the issues were and how we could actually move forward um, and, and, and begin to rethink what it was that we were wanting to do with those uh, special schools. And we have engaged a lot with our schools in and around governance structures, in and around re reference groups with all stakeholders, including parents and schools around what the best um, changes may be uh, moving forward. So, so that work has been ongoing and it has resulted in a draft framework that the EA have now produced, which sets out changing those recommendations into criteria under which we will judge our current special school estate against so that we can then make the changes. So when we looked at it, when you look at the mainstream, we had the Bain report, which turned into the sustaining schools policy with the six criteria, and it was against those six criteria that mainstream schools are judged. The sustainable schools criteria does not apply for special, so actually there's uh, something missing here between the recommendations from a report and moving straight into the area planning process. So what this framework is attempting to do is to turn those recommendations into criteria and we will consult on that criteria, and I'm very hopeful that we will have that consultation process rolled um, through by the end of this academic year, so that we're ready then to begin engaging and re-engaging with our schools um, post-summer. So, so that important step around ensuring we have agreement that those recommendations become criteria in and around the 3 to 19, the preschool, the closest school, is the part that we absolutely need to get right. So, so having gone back and reflected on that, that's the work that we are undertaking at the moment. So, um, okay. That's a, a, a significant amount of additional yep. detail in relation to that process. When precisely do you hope to be consulting on that criteria? So we have the draft framework drawn up. I am hoping to bring that through our governance structures within the EA in April, April's Education Committee, to begin <coughs> an eight-week eight consultation period in May and June. That's me saying that that's what I'm wanting to see. We have to run this through um, equality screening, um, rural screening and so on, but that's the pace of change I, w I want to see um, set, a, set against our, our Belfast schools. As you may know, the area planning for special schools and special provision has now come in under the Education um, Directorate as well, so we can set it in under our mainstream governance structures for area planning and hopefully get some more traction around it as a result. And would you be content to return to the committee early in that consultation process to yeah. Present them that criteria. Uh, we have a session for area planning. I think it's towards the end of April, so I would be April. hopeful that we would have that through our committee structures and agreed with the department at that stage. So, so if we have, we can we can bring it back. Maybe we can address it then. Okay. Uh, thank you. Bring uh, Deputy okay. Chair Karen Mullen in. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Barbara, Paula, Sharon, and Kim uh, for coming on today. Um, we heard last week how children are, and young people are being failed through the same practices 
and as Chris said, we've been speaking to many special uh, school leaders throughout the north. And um, from what I'm hearing, it's a similar situation, which is not acceptable. Um, and it's good to hear today from the leaders that they see this this move as a positive, and uh, it can be seen very positive in terms of going forward. So on that point, there needs to be a serious step change in relation to the Education Authority and how we listen and value our school leaders and special schools. Um, I met the Chief Executive as part of the Champaign team uh, on a number of occasions in relation to special schools over the last number of years and had been raising some of the issues. Um, and it was, you know, uh, we're, we're continuing to hear these. So we, this going forward, Needs to, needs to be a serious change. People need to be listened to. We've, we're hearing about underinvestment, um, lack of communication from the Education Authority um, across the board, no professional development for teachers and leaders, and that needs to be rectified and, and changed. Um, I'm not sure if you can answer this, Kim, but I've been told that they were not allowed to advertise for permanent staff that it's always temporary contracts, maybe some of the school leaders could... I think previously, um, <coughs> quite a number of years ago, um, four to five years ago, it was very difficult to get permanency. Um, I think whether EA was going through a change, um, special education um, area plan was being discussed. I think the, the um, EA found it very difficult to agree to um, permanency of staffing in that maybe they weren't sure as the way ahead and plus the numbers were changing at that stage in a very dramatic fashion. Um, I can say there, there is more permanency being offered and there is still a concern that there's a lot of temporary staff involved, especially when it comes to support staff um, and discretionary hours given to specific children. Um, I do appreciate um, the Education Authority are trying to take away discretionary hours and give us core hours. We're staffed slightly differently to a mainstream school. Um, but we're hopefully in the way to getting permanency because then we can actually start to build a team and provide training because the training obviously comes from ourselves. Sadly, there is no training currently, um, effective training um, from the Education Authority for Special. Um, but we're hopeful that that will be a positive move, that we can move towards permanency. Um, and the, the core staffing is now run across um, how we are staffed it is now regional um, previously different regions were staffed in different ways and as of I think three years ago yeah. um, all of us now have a staffing meeting we get a core staffing allocation for the year that does change so that does again cause problems because what you had last year you might have more or less the following year um, I think the staffing issue also is not just the hours and the permanency, it is the type of staff that we require. Classroom assistants are a fabulous, skilled group of people. We could not open our schools without them, as are our teachers, but our children demand more than that. They demand mm -hmm. therapy, as we've already discussed, through allied health. They also demand different types of, th excuse me, therapy, as in play therapists, art therapists, music therapists. Holistic needs of the children need to be met, and it's not just, and I don't mean to just um, uh, speak inappropriately regarding classroom assistance, but they cannot solve all of our problems. Um, they are not um, specifically trained, unless we train them ourselves in certain things, um, and they need a lot of support, but we do need additionality of staff, and the flexibility of staff is a different story altogether, but different types of staff, and they need to be effectively trained before they come through our door. That would be a huge issue as well. We are providing all of the training. As you said, there's very little um, training for our staff currently and in the last few years um, but our staff are coming and we're having to provide the training we're having to fund it we're having to locate it we're having to do joint working with each other to try and get effective staffing whether it be from health or from um, education bodies and that takes away from working with the children because we're having to constantly take people out to train them so it's a, a myriad of issues really when it when it comes to staffing and getting the correct type of staff correct trained staff and then having to retain staff um, a lot of staff get very burnt out. There's a lot of stress in our jobs, as we all know. It's a very, it can be a very physical yeah. <laughs> job with challenging behaviour and so on and so forth. Um, so it can be very stressful. And um, for some 
people in school, it's just overwhelming and they're off. So again, you're back into temporary staff and emergency mm -hmm. camera staff, which doesn't allow our schools to run effectively. Yeah. You know, so as effectively. That, has that been looked at? Is there uh, going to be and if I could maybe introduced? comment um, on that, I mean, one of the observations um, we've had, certainly from the education directorate, is how time consuming the placement of children, mm -hmm. the allocation mm -hmm. of staffing, and ensuring that the process runs smoothly is across our schools. What we are trying to bring through the lens of the education directorate is the education of the child and the pathway, the appropriate educational pathway of the child to ensure that we can optimise their life chances and indeed their chances of going on and having a career and, and, and to be a full part of the society in which they live. And so what we want to do is to bring our special school staff and principals more in, to be more inclusive in terms of the work that we do with all of our mainstream schools, whether that be looking at the school improvement agenda, self-evaluation, looking at the um, chief inspector's report and some of the inspection outcomes in terms of how we can improve, looking at curriculum provision, because, you know, on, on speaking to our special school <coughs> principals, these children are following the Northern Ireland curriculum. Yes, OK, disapplication applies at an individual level, but we would like to get clusters of teachers together to say, how can we change this curriculum to suit our children? How can we work together to do that? And then how can we go back and support each other in the learning and teaching back in the classroom? So through that lens, around working with our staff more with a lens of education focus, I do believe that that's going to lead to Im improvements um, for yeah. children's learning within mm -hmm. school, and I'm looking forward to that. I mean, our special schools work very closely with us on a range of projects, whether that be extended schools, some shared education projects, and a lot of projects through the education directorate anyway, so we're certainly looking to strengthen that. I would be keen to second the special school principal into the EA as well to help with that improvement journey and so that we have somebody who can work with us yeah. around the issues that, 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 that they know we're presenting. And we have seconded uh, school principals in different areas within the EA recently and that has proven to be very effective. So it's something that we would be looking to do with special schools as well. So I just want to reaffirm me that the Education Authority is looking at a plan of effective training and uh, looking around the needs of schools in terms of therapists and the different types of of staff that they need, so there's going to be a plan put in place, and obviously will involve the school leaders who have the expertise. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then just on the accommodation, um, uh, it, has been, it has been raised here today, and um, have been raised with with me in terms of a number of schools. We've Ross, Marshall, and Lamavari, who have struggled every step of the way um, over the last number of years, and um, I've heard from the principal there. Just what was, has been described this morning in terms of using stores as breakaway rooms, um, insisting that there's a science room in, in the school when they don't need it, but then they don't have a class, they don't have a playground. We've heard about um, no PE hall here today, which is, is scandalous. Um, that when we're looking at our children's health and well-being and uh, bringing them into school, they play with all their children and, and, and uh, have exercise, that there's no accommodation there to do it. So the lack of forward planning really, really concerns myself. Um, and it, you know, there needs to be a forward plan in each and every school around their accommodation, their future needs, their future intake of uh, children. You know, don't start do they arrive at the door in September, and it takes us three years to be able to pr provide um, what is required. And then I'm being told in, in my own city, the new school that's being currently built, Art and She, has already been built too small for the numbers that is there and that is going to be there by the time it's built. It just doesn't make sense. And we've heard that today from the leaders. So we need, again, back to, we need a ser serious step change. We need forward planning in all of this, and, and we need our leaders to be listened to and involved in, in the process. So, Kim, uh, I welcome the positive change in yourself, but I want you to take this back and um, and to the to the rest of the department. Okay, thank you, uh, Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you to each of you for your presentations and also for your complete honesty and uh, true reflection of the air crisis that is existing right across the sector. Uh, and uh, what we've heard in more recent weeks is uh, absolutely shocking. And today it only backs up that situation that something immediately needs to be done to support our children with special educational needs. Now, there is, it's no secret that uh, the, uh, the changes within a classroom environment are significant, uh, particularly when you consider the challenges of special schools. 
but even beyond that, those children that are now in mainstream schools that historically would have been in special education schools uh, is presenting significant difficulties for uh, the teacher of today, the principal of today, and certainly the children that surround a child with complex needs in a mainstream school. Uh, that presents uh, and has presented uh, clear difficulties, and we mentioned this last week uh, when we had the Education Authority before us, uh, that although we're hearing of figures of 1,070, I think, uh, in relation to children who are impacted, the real figure, the real time figure, is much more significant because of the rippling consequences uh, of uh, a situation arising in a classroom and the impact that has on children as well and also the lack of provision for classroom assistance. And I understand, Barbara, you said that the classroom assistance, whilst they do a fantastic job, will not be uh, where this is resolved, where this will be resolved and must be resolved, is with the Education Authority and with the Department of Education, who clearly uh, have failed thus far in relation to many aspects of children with special educational needs. I'm shocked to hear about the accommodation issues, uh, particularly uh, uh, some uh, of the, the detail around it. Uh, the storage room has been used, assembly halls, now classrooms, uh, potting sheds, cloakrooms. Uh, that is not the environment for any child, let alone a child with mm -hmm. uh, special educational needs. Mm -hmm. And again today, emanating from this committee, uh, will be will, will be shockwaves that will alarm quite a number of parents uh, out there who are concerned about <coughs> their children, particularly at a young age, uh, who will be advancing into education. Uh, just in relation to the uh, the issues around uh, accommodation. I'm assuming that the department and EA are conscious of how serious it is. I'm assuming, uh, because of what I've heard in the last few weeks, I'm not so sure that they are awake at all half the time when it comes to these situations. Uh, and I think that that is uh, something that I don't say lightly. I say that quite seriously, uh, because what I've heard from the last number of weeks it seems that many in positions of authority have been sleeping at the wheel, whilst children have been failed in classrooms uh, and right across the entire special educational needs sector. But I thank you all for your honesty. A lot of questions have been answered uh, in relation to uh, the points that I've had by the, the, the questions raised by the Chair. But I'm wondering, is there a time scale even uh, in relation to resolving some of the accommodation issues? And more so, is there funding available to resolve some of the accommodation issues across uh, these schools? Certainly, I think with the school enhancement programme, there are a number of our schools, my own and, and Sharon's mm -hmm. included, mm -hmm. where there is a time scale, there is work ongoing, and it will be completed within a specific time frame. But I think. Um, well, can I just check? Have you been awarded school enhancement yes. programme funding? Yes. Okay. Um, and I think it'll be two years now Before in April okay. since we got that. Okay. Um, and I know there. Are, you know there are other schools still waiting to go on to that, mm -hmm. um, and we're part you said, of. It. So it was awarded. The co award of funding was confirmed two years ago. Yes. What yes. is your time scale for completion of works? I think it's approximately four years. Is that uh, right? Your school is Brownview, January twenty twenty two. Yeah. So a six year timeline from award of funding to completion of works. I think the problem with my particular school is the fact that our school estate was saturated. There was nowhere else to is, Well, I'll ask him then, is, is six years extraordinary in terms of delivery of work? In that it school in particular, yes. having a look at the completion dates for all of the others, that is, yes, but it's, it's, is it's because of the purchase of the land yes, for your school. That's that's what, is, are, what are some of the other time scales? So under the school improvement um, um, programme, SEP1 programme, the completion dates have all been now completed apart from... Yeah, actually, they're all completed. The SEP ones are all completed. SEP two but completion. What, what, what was the average time scale for from award of funding to completion of works? Um, I don't have that time scale just with me, um, yeah. Chris. Around that, the completion date for most of the SEP two is either June twenty twenty two to um, November December twenty. Is there a reason why it's taking so long? I think it just depends on the nature of the programme of work and also all of the RBIA stages, which I'm, I'm not familiar with, but there's a number of stages <coughs> that that has to go through. But, but I would say, just part. maybe coming back on Daniel's point, the, the minor capital works is around reconfiguring the space. So, I mean, mm -hmm. although, I mean, these, our, our principals are saying this is the space that it used to be, whether it be a potting shed or whether it be, 
the space has been reconfigured through minor capital works into classroom yes. space. It's not that children are actually being educated in those spaces right now, and I think that that's an important um, message. So we do work in terms of the minor works to, to make the accommodation adjustments. And, and as you may know, in terms of the child getting the statement, it depends on where that child's statement says that child may go. So out of the, out of the 20,000 children that we currently have, you know, that have a statement, only 6,000 go to special schools, a number of those children will be educated in specialist units or with special support in mainstream. So we cannot assume just because we have this number of children coming through as being assessed for a statement that that will automatically mean that we need to find the accommodation needs within the school because every individual child will be considered on its own merit in terms of where we place that child. So, so that's you know, some, some of the, some uh, of the challenges uh, I, I guess I we have around that. I think the committee uh, appreciate that, that. however, Given what we've learned about the statementing process, I have no confidence in it, uh, particularly under the leadership of EA in the last week. Uh, and I think that uh, is something that the public have great concern about, given that uh, uh, official documentation, important documentation in relation to vulnerable children, wasn't even been date stamped deliberately to, uh, to uh, uh, in some way, delay the process of that child getting help, some up to the extent of two years, which will open up. I have no doubt after recent revelations, all sorts of legal consequences uh, uh, in the future for EA. But in relation to, and I, I also appreciate as well, uh, Kim, that minor works would have been carried out in various spaces within the existing school building. But given the obvious delays to any form of works within special schools, my concern is in the delay in getting that storeroom changed to a classroom. Yes, of and what happens in the interim of that particular period in terms of the complex need of that particular child or children? That, that's also a big uh, concern for many uh, parents as well. Uh, and I note that, uh, and Sharon gave a very detailed presentation and a very honest one. Uh, in terms of the school enhancement programme, I think you hit on a very key point. The school enhancement programme, although will enhance the existing building, does not go anywhere near dealing with the needs of these children. It's a sticking plaster approach, uh, uh, again, by the department, pumping money into a situation that is actually not going to resolve uh, the issue in schools. The other thing is in relation to the number of schools impacted, and that might have been said when I was outside of the room, what is the total number of special education schools that are requiring or have accommodation difficulties? So 14 applications came through for the second call in October 17 of the, of the SEP programme. Ten have been successful and another four are on a waiting list. So yeah, that, that's, however, that's just the SEP programme. I presume the yeah. accommodation needs extend beyond the schools that have applied for SAP, obviously. Yes, and they, they could be addressed through the minor works um, as well, yeah. Uh, well, you're not, sorry to cut across you, you're, you're not proposing to deal with the accommodation needs of special schools just via SAP or minor works, surely? No, absolutely not, and that's why we have the capital programme as well. We have four, t two schools completed on that and two schools in train in terms of the capital, so we have the capital programme as well. So that's six schools in total then? in the capital programme? Four. Oh, and two of them have already completed? Uh, completed, yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, how, ma how many special schools are there again in Northern Ireland, as you stated earlier? Four. Mm -hmm. OK. Sorry, Dan, did you want a you, brief, you, brief you, final... Just to raise, raise another there? point as well. Uh, we, we, uh, Kim, you've, you've rightly touched on the statementing of children. G given what we've learned in the last few weeks, I have no doubt that quite a number of children have slipped through the proverbial net and have ended up in mainstream schools. Now, we talk about infrastructure in terms of special education schools, but there's absolutely a situation arising in terms of mainstream schools that the department doesn't seem to even recognise, uh, which they need to wake up to very, very quickly. The issue that we have overall here is that children with special educational needs, regardless if it's in special educational schools or in mainstream schools, have been absolutely failed by a clear lack of vision or uh, leadership from the department or the education authority. And I'm sorry if I sit here and say this, but I do believe that the children of today have been treated or have ended up as the collateral damage for the systemic, systemic failure of EA and the department in relation to their complex needs. And I am very, very appreciative for teachers and school leaders such as those who are sitting in front of us today for their absolute honesty uh, and those who have spoken in more recent weeks as well and many who have reached out to com committee members around this table about what is going on within the sector. Our children must not be failed. These are vulnerable children. And it is our responsibility to step up and deliver for them. And it worries me for the second week in a row that I am hearing how failed these children are continuing to be by people who are supposed to deliver for them.
Now, that is no reflection of the school leaders. They are doing their absolute best with the situation that they're in and with the accommodation that they have. It's up to the Department and the Education Authority to take some responsibility. And again, Chair, it will lead me on to say again that there needs to be a review entirely uh, of all processes around special educational needs and indeed the entirety of the EA. I do believe children have been failed and I'm continuing to have that belief as the weeks go on. But I do thank you for your presentations uh, and I'm sure other questions will arise. Thank you. Right, Daniel, could I just say, again, coming back to the fact that we're now under education, mm -hmm. yeah. we have felt for many, many years that the children in special schools were the add-on. We were always thought, we were always yeah. an afterthought. Mm -hmm. Everything happened in education and then, oh, we've special. forgotten mm -hmm. about special, or we would complain and right, we have to do something there. We are now feeling under education that we are being listened to, that someone is actually listening to what we're saying and prepared to work with us. Yeah. And we think that is a very positive move forward. Yes, we know there's an awful lot to be done, we do feel that's a very positive move. If we're under the education directorate, therefore we're being seen mm -hmm. as all other schools are. And our children, certainly I don't know if my colleagues would agree with me, but our children being the most vulnerable in society should be the first Absolutely. and foremost Absolutely. children yes. looked at. And Absolutely. everything else should flow from there out. Mm -hmm. Instead of us being the add-on, it should be completely reversed. Yeah, no, we hold, feel hold we are being that I need to bring other members in. Literally one point. Go ahead, very quick. When was that change made, just uh, for clarity's sake? About um, January? Four to five weeks ago, yeah. 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 So it was made after the, or just before the results of the internal audit came out that, that actually highlighted that before. there was a systemic failure of children with special educational needs. Yeah, and, and can, maybe, can I just come, come back on one point? Can I, can I bring some more members in and allow okay. you to try and come back to it and other questions? Okay. Uh, Catherine Kelly? Um, thank you for coming today and I'd first say like to commend um, yourselves and other special school principals and teachers and classroom assistants for the amazing work that you're doing day and daily under all of these pressures um, that we've been discussing today and you're able to meet the needs of every child um, both educationally and otherwise um, that's in your care. Um, I, my question is on enrolment um, and they have the authority over that um, and it's particular, particularly concerning when pupil numbers and their needs exceed capacity within special schools. Um, Kim, what safeguards does the EA employ to ensure in enrolling pupils their needs can be fully met um, in line with existing capacity within each school? Question. Uh, and, and thank you, and thank you for Kath Catherine. And can I also I agree that our school leaders are doing and teachers are doing a terrific job in terms of educational outcomes? So every individual um, child who is on the on the framework, um, um, once they get to stage four, that is when the assessment is triggered in terms of whether or not that child will then receive a, a statement for stage five. And then the statement will be what determines the very specific needs of every individual child. That statement may suggest that a child is better placed in mainstream with their peers, with specialist support, uh, or it may be a specialist unit in mainstream, or it may be a special school. And as part of that statement, it will outline very, very clearly what the assessed needs are for that child that will then be picked up. And so when that child is placed, working alongside the parent in a special school, that's when the conversations with the special school <coughs> principals take place to say, are these needs that are here going to be met within your school adequately? How can we help and what other provision do we need to put in place to ensure that those needs may be met? And that provision may be an additional classroom <coughs> assistant or whatever that may be. So that happens on an individual basis and then the child is placed. So it's not a case of saying, actually, this school has some capacity here, this school doesn't, so we place the child here as opposed to here. It really does is determined by that statement in terms of where the best place will be for the child. Thank you, Kim. Um, I think that the special school principals um, should have more of an input um, into um, this issue mm -hmm. um, because, as we've heard here today, capacity is is becoming um, tighter and tighter capacity. and um, mm -hmm. enrolment is becoming more and more. Um, and I think that when a special school principal um, relays fears um, in the fact that they may not have the space or the staff or whatever it may be, that needs to be taken into account. Um, 
because the, the, the child, the pupil, is at the <coughs> centre of it all. Um, and it's just, I, I know in mainstream schools, Board of Governors are the authority on enrolment. Um, and it's just to relay my, my uh, feelings on that um, in light of speaking to special school principals. Could I also add something here? Um, one of our concerns as principals is in the past when we have staffing meetings, um, and almost to go back to accommodation, we know what our school estate looks like and we know how many children can be effectively educated in certain rooms or certain uh, places. And in those staffing meetings, it is really important that the officer that liaises with us understands the context of the school. It's not just about a total number and you divide that by a certain number to get a number of staff. And, and um, you know, that in the past has been what has happened. And, you know, in my case, I have a room that can only have five pupils. There, it is from health and safety perspective with five tiny ASD pupils, pupils who have really complex autistic spectrum disorder. I can only put five children in that room, and yet I'm being told in the past that I must put six or maybe up eight. to eight. Yeah. You're saying, so why in the, is that not happening any longer? Well, I'm hoping now we're under the Director of Education that the Directorate, that, that maybe we're going to have a more open conversation and we can be very clear about the criteria for staffing mm -hmm. in special schools. We can be clear about looking at the estate and there's a transparency even between special schools and how these conversations, how the total number of staff is actually um, arrived at. Yeah. Can I, sorry, could I also add, um, we, are, we have our staffing meeting and so on and so forth. Um, we are presented um, in the third term usually with children's um, paperwork for us to consider. Um, I think there's a lack of trust in our professionalism. Mm -hmm. If, as Sharon said, we all know our school estate, we all know the needs of the individual children, and just because a child has got a same diagnosis, um, ASD, MLD, SLD, speech, speech and language, whatever it may be, our children come through our door as individuals and we treat them as individuals because their needs are vastly different. If, as professional principals and teachers, we are saying that's enough in that room, we need to be trusted by the Education Authority that that is the correct thing. Sharon also said about effective teaching. We can put as many children as you would like in a room to make sure that every child has a statutory place in the correct school, but we won't be teaching them. We'll be babysitting yeah, them. Absolutely. And there is an element of that going on. I can say yeah. that about my own school. Um, no, I, I don't want parents to think that's what we do. We do not. We teach our children to the best of our ability, um, and my staff are fantastic at doing that. However, we could do it better. <coughs> we could do it better. We have done it better previously. We could do it better in the future. So, so We're it, hoping under education yeah, it, that will improve. It, yes. it, so is the education authority, our education system, enrolling more pupils than our special schools can effectively accommodate at this moment in time? I suppose the issue is the children are there. Yes. And they must be accommodated. Um, and our schools are the most ap appropriate place for them. But we possibly need more special schools. And what, what, what is the mm -hmm. education... Right, that, it's a major problem. What, what is the Education Authority doing to address that problem or to alerting the Department of Education? What? Uh, this isn't... We, we've received a fair few briefings in relation to budgets. I, I don't recall <coughs> any official raising with this committee uh, an urgent issue with regards to the amount of special school pupils we are accommodating in our special schools, but it, it sounds like it's a major problem. So what, what is the Education Authority doing to respond to that? So we're absolutely looking, as I said in my opening statement, it's approximately a 4% rise per year in terms of our children going into special schools, those children that are statemented. And we are looking right across the whole range um, in terms of the framework around ensuring that all of our children are placed in the right place uh, according to their needs, and that will continue to happen. And so where we do see the increases required with the schools, that's where we need to look at what the accommodation needs are. And if we are asking our schools to increase the pupil numbers, we need to work really closely with the schools to see whether that can be accommodated. So I don't think it's a matter of that, just that, saying... Uh, that, that's a, a, a really... Um 
articulate way to describe the situation. It doesn't sound in any way mm-hmm. as stark or urgent as it's being described by special school principals. And, and I'm not, you know, putting this to the special it, school it principals is, here today difficult. necessarily. Sorry. But and I mean, I'm coming from a. I suppose a standpoint from moderate learning difficulty and historically our school was moderate learning difficulty. The area plan then was suggesting that we go towards SLD 3 to 19. My <coughs> colleagues in M will always explain that our children also need very specialist provision um, and whether we're M or S regardless of what those titles are I don't necessarily agree with those myself but um, our children are complex and they need the correct provision and they need it in a, a very specific Um, space, they need very specific input and they need the right numbers in the classrooms. I think what could free up a little bit of um, give in the system, because I appreciate the budget is the budget at times, Um, mainstream schools who would, some of our children historically in M would have gone towards a mainstream school or in for secondary education, absolutely appropriate uh, and correct. Um, but the mainstream schools are not being funded or the infrastructure is not there to deal with our type of pupils coming into them. So we have children and parents have come back to us and said, you know, my child has gone into a mainstream education. They couldn't cope. They thought they could. They tried. They're not disparaging the mainstream. They tried, but the provision wasn't there. My child's back into special. But in that, their child has had a meltdown. There's been problems in that school, which has also then had a knock-on effect of those children who are the highest of our society, you know, the highest academic of our society. So their education's been affected. So, you know, there's a knock-on effect in all of this. Um, Yes, we may need more special schools. Yes, we may need more specialist provision within our special schools. But we also need more specialist provision in our mainstream schools. Mm -hmm. And I don't think our mainstream colleagues would disagree with us. But the infrastructure is not there. And I can only speak from my own school. Um, I would put it that the cart, you know, we were moderate. We have now got um, our first three years of of our school are predominantly severe to to significant learning difficulties. So the cart has been put before the horse in our position. We are not ready for them. We're not totally... We have put everything in ourselves to make it as effective for those children and we do... Our teachers do a superb job. But with the correct infrastructure and the proactive thinking, there's a lot of reactive thinking has been (coughs) done. Previously, we're hoping it's going to be proactive now under education, but previously it's been reactive. There have been sticking plasters, there have been, you know, classroom assistants. Our classroom assistants are excellent, but they're not specialistly trained people. Okay. And also in mainstream, you know, putting a, a classroom assistant does not solve their problem either. Thank you. But we also feel that the Department of Health, have, there's an issue here too. Absolutely. We need much more input from health. Yeah. For example, if I just use my own school as an example, we've had no increase, no actual increase in provision of our uh, allied health yes. professionals, yet my school has tripled in size. Who holds that the account? The, the, the input of health trusts in special education is obviously vital. Mm-hmm. Who, who holds that the account when, it, when it's not adequate like that, Kim? <coughs> Well, I mean, we, we have good working relationships with health, but at the end of the day, it's the health professional's decision as to where and when they believe that they need to interface with education, because obviously predominantly children in special schools are there to be educated. So there is partnership working there, and health will have their own work to do in terms of the health needs of that child. So, so it is, I mean, we're, we're working together, but I'm not sure that we can you know, stipulate actually we need to have a health worker working in this classroom at this time. Here, here's my point. This we need. this committee can hold the EA to account yeah. on its provision. Okay. Who who is asking health trusts mm. about their provision in special schools? Is the health committee doing it? Yeah. Or, or department doing it? I I think yeah, there's yeah, potentially a gap well. here yeah. and we can we can mm-hmm. look at that. I have yeah. four more members to bring in so I'll, okay. I'll ask people to be con- as concise as possible, but I appreciate your patience and waiting to ask a question as well. So, uh, Justin McNulty. Thank you, Chair. Thank you all for coming to this committee today, and thank you for your, your presentations this far and for your obvious passion making a difference in the area of special educational needs. Um, I have an issue which has been raised with me via correspondence with a, a concerned parent from Rathor Special School in Newry, or Rathor School in Newry. I firstly want to applaud um, Caroline Curry, who's the headmistress and her teacher staff, support staff, classroom assistants, parents and pupils for 
their combined efforts in making what is a special, wonderful learning environment, and you've all contributed the, contributed massively to that. Um, I would ask you to be patient with me because I want to read out this correspondence because I think it's cross cutting and I think it's very relevant in terms of what's happened in the last number of weeks, what, what's been communicated to us in the last number of weeks at this committee. Just if I ask you to try and make sure it is cross cutting now, it, 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 it is, it is cross cutting. Okay. I wouldn't read it otherwise. Our children currently attend nursery preschool in Rathor School in Yerry, which is a special educational needs school. A number of, of pupils' parents from the, the Rathor nursery class received letters this week confirming that their child's placement at Rathor next year was confirmed. When made aware of this, I, together with other parents who had received any correspondence from the Education Authority, contacted them to follow up on the status of our children's places. None of the contacts I tried at the Education Authority would take our, or return our calls on Friday, and I received a simple acknowledgement to my email at the end of the day, noting that the EA would be in touch early next week. All the parents have been verbally told by the EA staff on, on the phone that, that the letters of confirmation sent out to some of the parents earlier in the week were sent in error, as proper protocol had, been, had not been followed to allocate places. EA staff seemed to be unaware that these letters had been sent prior to us raising the query, and it, was, it has been said that the letters will in fact be retracted next week and places will not be confirmed until June. More alarmingly, it has, also been made, it has also been made aware to us that there is an all-time high number of children who will require a place at Rathor in September 2020, a school year, and we have been alerted to the fact that the school is unable to meet the demand as, as the forecast intake is higher than those leaving the academic year, and the school is full to capacity as the building simply isn't large enough to accommodate. <coughs> so as you can expect, there's a lot of anxious parents now worrying about their child's future school placement at Rathor. There is more information there in relation to the statements, more concerns about the statementing process, which, which has the parents feel failed by, and we, we've been, um, we've been um, updated on that in recent weeks, so that's a major concern for the parents as well. In that context, um, where you, you've, you've mentioned the proposed framework for future provision for children with early years uh, with SEN, in early years with SEN, proposal one is communication. In that context, how, how can the Education Authority explain what has happened there? Thank you, and thank you for bringing that to my attention, Justin, and we'll, we'll absolutely look into all correspondence that we get in um, in terms of some of the issues around processes, um, and, and I don't know that case individually, but, but we'll certainly um, look into that. Um, you're right, as, as part of the framework um, which has been set down, there's been six proposals um, as part of the early years framework. I had said before that um, a strategic longer term view is to offer 3 to 19 provision right across all of our special schools in a consistent way. We are hopeful that by September we will have 29 of those 40 special schools um, with preschool provision, Rathor is one of those. Um, in that LGD, we do have an issue in and around um, special school uh, provision um, in and around Newry Morning Down, and we're aware of that as well. Going back to your question then about um, communication, so from the six proposals, um, the first one was looking at developing easily accessible information um, for parents and, and stakeholders, and the uh, information relating to the early years services are on the website through the SEN Early Years Inclusion Service, and there's a lot of information there that provides support for children, families, um, and so on in terms of preschool um, settings. There's a regional service, there is contact information on that um, website for each of the each of the different areas for any concerned parents then to contact through uh, to the EA. I fully appreciate from what you're saying there has been a breakdown in terms of communication there and we need to take another look at that. We've also put an online training calendar um, on that site uh, to support again all people working with, with preschool children in and around how we can support them um, in their early years and we have made external and internal linkages across agencies and different organisations as part of that proposal around communication as well. There is more work to be done, there absolutely is, but we do believe we have made a good start in terms of working better to communicate. Communication is an issue and a theme that has run right across from the establishment of EA, and we absolutely understand and appreciate that. Our first couple of years, as we went from five boards into one authority, was business continuity. We need to look up and out 
across our schools, across our stakeholders, and reach out and say we need to do better in terms of communication. We've started that journey. We've started running a lot of locality leadership networks and organised locality conferences with school principals. We've invited them in for, for principals' forums, and we are communicating and reaching out to our special school principals as well, because we need to find collective leadership solutions that will take us forward <coughs> so that we're all together and that we're able to listen and we're able to get you know, ideas and information about how we can move forward with communication. So it's absolutely on the EA's agenda. And I do believe, speaking anecdotally to a number of individual principals, that they do feel communication is getting better and it's something that we need to con continue to do. So, so look, I, I'll take that back. Um, Brief, just brief supplementary, Justin. Um, yeah. Very quickly, yep. yeah, those parents would like reassurance, yep. number one, on the communication. Absolutely. Confusion and number two, number two on the, the stipending process. Number three on accommodation. They need they need reassurance that there will be accommodation in that school where their kids have entered uh, the preschool. Um, Listen, Alley is another very very special school in Armagh where the principal, Mrs. Flynn, and, and her staff and, and parents and pupils have created a wonderful learning environment. And they've been <coughs> assigned, uh, they've been um, notified that they will get monies under the school enhancement program, mm -hmm. but they haven't been told what that actually entails. That so they need that okay. information. We can't we can back. Okay. And, and finally, um, have you received any guidance from the Education Authority or has the Education Authority issued any guidance to schools, principals, or have you got guidance from the Minister for Education, from the Minister for Health in relation to contingencies around the coronavirus? Okay, um, thank you. Uh, as we know, coronavirus <coughs> issues are changing on a daily basis. We <coughs> have been in close contact with the department and the PHA over the last few weeks. The department has issued a letter to all schools outlining where to go to in terms of the website for the PHA and what to do if they um, have any issues and questions to ask. We have had a lot of correspondence from our school principals around individual issues, whether that be school trips, um, whether that be individual um, issues that they're bringing to our attention, and we're working through those. Yesterday, we met with officials from the PHA um, alongside CCMS colleagues to look at what our contingency plans are going to look like moving forward and look at how we can improve support um, to schools. So we have a number of actions that we will progress as a matter of um, urgency from the meeting yesterday. Um, we are going to put another um, guidance letter out to schools and staff um, to <coughs> ensure that they know and understand what to do um, given a, a number of, of issues that they may face. Um, we're also going to share regular guidance provided through um, PHA on our social media website and we're going to provide staff with guidance on HR issues should they arise in terms of maybe staff not being able to come into schools and arrange for appropriate key contacts across the EA, across the directorates that schools can pick up the phone to um, and, and talk to as issues, as issues arise. So as I say, evolving situation, but we do believe we are doing everything we can at the moment. Very, very to brief, confirm, very Kim, brief. confirm to me, so up to this point, the guidance that's been issued to headmasters and principals um, has been look at the PHA website. That has been what ha the PHA has advised the Department of Education to do. So it's my understanding that that's what the letter essentially told principals. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you, you may well be. Do you believe that's sufficient in the, in the current context of the, the dangers that are potentially eminent? Not with our schools, no. Particularly for, um, vulnerable, particularly for the, vulnerable children. And yeah, mm -hmm. Because of the complex medical needs of our children. Mm -hmm. So, um, you're, some of these so children you've been told like to look at the PHA website? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 And we did have a situation with one of our special schools um, where a member of staff had come in contact with someone mm -hmm. who was confirmed to have coronavirus. Um, the person themselves phoned the number that was on the PHA website and were told, you're not showing any symptoms at the moment, it's okay to go to school. She then contacted the principal, who was alarmed to have heard that this person was OK to come to school. She rang the same number, spoke to these people again, explained the nature of the children, and was told, oh, well, it's your call then. But it's not, it should not yeah. be a principal's no. call. No, no. This is a medical issue. Yes, shocking. You know? How worried are you, given the... Given the, the Extremely the, worried. Very I think worried. all of our principals very are worried. very worried about our, what's going to happen. We have very complex children yeah, with absolutely. very complex health needs, children mm -hmm. in oxygen, children mm -hmm. with heart and lung problems. Very life limited. Life limited children, children on DNRs. You know, we need 
really clear guidance. clear guidance on what to do. But we feel that has to come from a health, health care perspective. Yeah. Um, and we raised, we had yeah. correspondence in mm -hmm. from our special school principals, and we raised those very issues yeah. with PHA yesterday yeah. and asked them to give us some more guidance in terms of what yes. we would do, particularly yeah. with special schools. So, so that is an, an emergency. And has the health minister been in touch with the education authority in, in this regard? Not with the as far as I know, not with the education authority, but maybe with the department um, in that regard. Yeah. It's all a bit up in the air, wouldn't you think, given the, the severity of the of the threat? Yeah. Well, we, we we can add that to our correspondence that's going to the department today. I was I was um, described as walking down a blind alley on Monday for asking questions around this matter. I'm yeah. glad you've had the opportunity to voice your concerns in relation to it here today. Justin, have to move on. Okay, thank you for your questions. Uh, Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, uh, really welcome the delegation Jim, to him, to Jaron, to Paula and, and to Barbara. Um, uh, my, my questions really are in two areas around the the buildings uh, and, and the staffings. Uh, I do want to say, first of all, I think in terms of the, I think it was Paula who raised it, about the complex medical needs and as medical science moves on and medical skills are enhanced, that indeed, it is likely that the changing complex needs of, of, of of your pupils is going to be increasingly uh, difficult. Um, yeah, uh, and we need to understand how that is uh, going to be taken into account in in the future. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I really valued your remarks, Paula, about valuing our children, all our children. Yes. So much appreciated for, for that. In terms in terms of. Um, the uh, schedule of accommodation, uh, Kim, and tell me, I, I know that you're expressing benefit from the uh, SEP alliances and so on, but are those, those are really only minor in terms of what you need overall, am I right in, in that? Um, they can have a significant impact on the school, yeah. a significant positive impact on the school. Um, and I think one of the concerns we have is our schools can become too big as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. which is not a good thing. We need to keep our schools relatively small so that you have a very clear understanding of the needs of all of the pupils in your school mm -hmm. and how their education is progressing. And the bigger our schools get, the harder that is to do. So we don't necessarily want huge schools. We prefer our schools to stay smaller, and the legs of the SEP program allows us to do that. Okay. Um, but there are there certainly are need for more schools because of the increasing numbers, but also because of the the change in the profile. We need our classes to be smaller. Absolutely. So therefore, our our schools actually don't have the same capacity as they previously did. Uh, we can't have those classes with the larger numbers in them anymore, um, because the the needs of the children can't be met in those larger classes. So it means actually the capacity of the school reduces. Mm -hmm. Plus, when, when you're thinking about staffing um, schools with very complex needs, one of the things that needs to be taken into consideration is that multidisciplinary working. And traditionally, vice principals link with health and social services. I'm finding my vice principal, that's all she's doing because we have so many complex children. Yeah. And I don't have a second VP uh, traditionally in uh, secondary schools or very large primary schools. They will be looking and supporting the curriculum needs. Um, and another thing that uh, maybe in the past, um, coming from five board areas to one education authority, there hasn't been um, consistency in how management uh, allocations and uh, management allowances are allocated. And indeed, there isn't really clarity in how we move forward in that. And there needs to be consistency and transparency. 
um, in terms of staffing, but also in terms of management allowances and how that impacts on the management of a school. Because you will find that senior managers in many of our schools um, are carrying out tasks that senior managers in mainstream secondary schools yeah. and primary schools mm -hmm. would not be doing. And in actual fact, most of our vice principals are also teaching vice principals. Absolutely. So they are still, they have a certain part of their week, mm -hmm. they are still teaching as well as taking on all of these additional roles. Absolutely. Okay, uh, can I go to that end and come back to the buildings if you mm -hmm. don't mind? Uh, and I, I have to say, I welcome your remarks, Kim, or your enthusiasm, um, and about getting this joined upness uh, and certainly the desire of the principals to Absolutely. be within education as opposed to health. But in terms of, and we briefly discussed this when we met uh, informally, and that's really around the continuing professional needs <coughs> of each member of staff, which is not just in the teaching area, but is in the medical area as well. And, and, and simply to describe it under uh, continuing professional development for staff members. Can I ask you, Kim, how, how are we, the special needs teachers, the special needs principals, the special needs support staff, how is their continuing professional development going to be addressed via education? And I imagine it can, can't be addressed without involvement from health at the same time. Um, thank you. So, so there's a range of training. Some of that training is actually statutory, which happens on an ongoing basis, and there is a, a comprehensive training programme across a lot of the, the stage three services and a lot of um, training that our staff need to undergo annually. And indeed, having spoken to, to the principals, some of the issues that they were raising with me was in and around the, the 10 days, the five plus five days allocated. Whereas in mainstream, there's a lot more opportunity for teacher professional development within those days. But in special schools, a lot of those days are taken up on, on, on statutory training. And that's something that we need to look at. And we need to be able to protect those extra five days training so that we can have <coughs> teacher professional development um, over and above. So as I'd said before, what I plan to do is to finances um, hopefully and um, will come with this is to second a special school principal that will work alongside us to look at what the bespoke training needs of special school staff are over and above the training program that we will offer for mainstream because a lot of the work that we do now in and around teacher professional learning is working in clusters and groups of schools rather than them all coming out into what used to be in the past centre-based training for a full day and then individuals would go back in. So it's looking on building capacity across schools. So it's where our special school staff fit and sit with that so that they're working alongside our mainstream college, colleagues with training. So we have lots of different ways in which we deliver training, whether that be first-time principal training, whether that be middle leadership training, whether that be specific subject-based training, induction training, governor training, that we want to ensure that our special schools have the voice and that they are included in terms of how we design that training, but also then how, how, that is, uh, how that's delivered to our schools. So, so, I mean, we're at the start of this, this process, but I'm certainly very keen that we engage collectively with our school leaders in terms of what that's going to look like moving forward. And that would include uh, you, education, working with health to make sure there is this addressing those health needs. We, 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 do, we do that. We, we need to continue okay. to do that, yes. yes. Okay. Can I just, Chair, can I just come back yep. to, uh, it's really about the, the, the accommodation then, uh, Kim. Mm -hmm. At what stage, at what stage would you think we're in a position to say we have made significant progress on accommodation? <laughs> I'm not sure that I can answer that, I can answer that um, here this morning. We are doing a lot of work, the ground that we've covered in terms of the, of the major works and, and, and SEP and minor works. I think what we need to do is push forward with our area planning strategy because the outworkings of that area planning will then tell us what the footprint is for special schools um, moving forward. So that's absolutely what we need to move forward on and advance that because there isn't really any point in continuing to add on and, and improve when we don't have the strategic 
footprint around the consistent provision for special schools right across um, Northern Ireland. So I think that that will be part and parcel of the, of the area planning strategy. I'm not sure sitting here we'll ever get to a place where we're saying we have this. We have this. Um, I'm only component. asking significant progress. <laughs> <laughs> well, significant progress. I would hope. I would hope that on the back of our strategic area plan that we would be able to link that in with capital, um, our, our capital build. And at that stage, I do believe we will have made more significant progress than certainly uh, we've made at the when, moment. When might we reach that stage? So, um, as I said earlier, in terms of our area planning framework, that's the first stage that we need to consult on that. I'm very clear that I want to move the actions for area planning for special schools forward in the next academic year. Okay, just, just yep. quickly, Chair. In terms of, uh, I think the principals had mentioned that they of belief that we may need additional schools. Mm. Are we taking that into account? Absolutely, and that will be part of our planning for area planning in terms of looking at the pupil numbers, looking at the increases in pupil numbers coming through, looking at the geographical spread, and looking at that 3 to 19 provision. So that will all form part of our deliberation and consideration around that. And it may well be that we need additional special school as a result of that. We're happy for you to locate one of those in East Belfast, by the way. <laughs> um, Robbie Butler. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, guys. Um, we could probably spend all day here, mm. and uh, mm -hmm. everybody has their own priorities, but this, this has to be a significant priority for all of us, and I know for, for, for the vocation that you guys have chosen, that has been your, 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 your life piece of work. Um, and I'll declare an interest, because my daughter is a second year in Queen's doing learning disability nursing, actually. so. I hear about some of this stuff almost on a daily basis and some of the challenges. And perhaps possibly the, the different conversations are not ha happening between education and health actually, possibly, and some of the good stuff too. It's, mm -hmm. not, that, it's mm -hmm. not that there's not good stuff um, happening. I've just a, a range of questions here. Some of it has already been touched on. So if it has and I've missed it, when I've nipped out the powder my nose, forgive me. Okay. <laughs> um, so you did say, Kim, that 50% uh, of special schools um, are providing enrolment from three to nineteen, but that was also that was picked up in a review, review commissioned by John O'Dowd in 2014-15. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now five years on from that, yeah. and is that still the same figure? Um, so what I'd like to ask is what steps were taken from the findings of that review in 2015 till now, and why possibly we haven't seen that uh, expand, and what plans you have to expand? Um, sorry, can I? Is that the review of special schools you're you're talking about? So sure, um, I need to go back in here. So it's yeah, the, the ministerial review. Suppose the preschool, the, school, the, me, the ministerial review. Yeah. Of special yeah. Yeah. So, so you looked at yeah. so at that stage. They identified yeah. one of the things they identified yeah. was that yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. three to nine, four to six. So, so, so yes, that review, and I, I have touched on this earlier, but I'll, I'll go back over it. That review. Um, had six recommendations in and around special schools, um, 12 recommendations in total. Yep. And those recommendations were very much grounded in consistency of provision, um, the child able to attend their closest school, 3 to 19 provision, preschool provision, um, and so on. Um, and those recommendations then formed part of the strategic area plan for 2017 to 2020. But actually, what had happened is we jumped a step straight from recommendations into planning. And so when we went out to communities and schools around the plans for special schools at that time, we were met with a lot of resistance because what we hadn't done is we hadn't set up a set of criteria under which we would judge our current school <coughs> estate, okay. similar to what we have done on the sustainable schools policy for mainstream schools, which special schools aren't a part of. So actually that has been the reason why there has been very, very little progress made in terms of special school area planning to date. You rightly said, yes, uh, th that's right, there are half of our schools already configured in that way. So I am very hopeful that once we get our framework completed and the consultation phase run through, that we will be able to start moving on different clusters of special schools to look to see whether that's the best configuration within the next academic year. Robbie, can I, can I ask a supplementary very briefly? Can you give us an idea of what the criteria is going to look like? Yeah, so, so it will be based on the recommendations. It has to be based on the recommendations. There was, there was some resistance to some of the yeah. recommendations, yeah. particularly with regards to the idea of it being able to deliver a, a near a school yeah. being suitable for mm -hmm. every child, yeah. And uh, I suppose our, our issue, and, and the area planning is complex, and our issue with area planning is that we're planning strategically for a footprint across Northern Ireland, but we're consulting with parents who very genuinely 
rightly so, have their children placed in a provision that they're happy with, that they can see progress with, and they're desperate not to let go. So we may consult on closest school, or we may consult on extending the age frame, and an individual parent may look at that and say, that's actually going to perhaps threaten the place that my child is in right now. I'm not sure that I can agree with that. So it's, so it's from a very individual basis, and rightly so. So what we need to do throughout this consultation is to put in the reassurances in and around what that longer term strategy will look like, but also the reassurances around the children who are placed already and the expectations for parents around that. And so, so that's the part I think I, I'm not sure that they are completely against what the recommendations are, Chris. I think it's just about how that will impact on them as individuals, and we need to find a way to work around that as we move it forward. Sorry, Robbie, okay, thank I, you. I think um, the, the I'll link this into another one we've got at the bottom, which is uh, the, the enrolment in early years, because I was really interested in, and I know Justin's been pushing the, 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 the Minister for Education on the ski trip stately and that, and, and, and the advice he's given to schools. But I raised with the, the, the minister this week, particularly around vulnerable children in our special schools, mm -hmm. should not, because those are the most vulnerable people. Um, because the, the reality is, when you read about it in terms of the mortality, which you've, ta you've touched on, that the school years for this community is absolutely critical because it could be the most significant part of their life. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need to, to, to weigh in quite strongly in this to make sure that we get it right from the earliest point. To, to 19 or whatever that is actually I mean, it may, may not just be 19 because we're, we're looking at the parameters that already exist and is that, you know, is, is that what, we, what we look at um, I have a particular interest in uh, mental health, well-being and resilience Okay, we did touch on curriculum a little bit um, could you just explain to me I'm not going to challenge anybody, I'm just going to ask you what does it look like um, looking at and trying to identify the underlying maybe mental health uh, needs that aren't so easily identified because it's very easy to see something mm. uh, a disability at mm. times. But what what is the curriculum suitable for that? And if not, is that a maybe ask talent? my yeah. colleagues yes. to, to I think um, no, go ahead. No, go ahead I'm just coming from children coming in at three, and obviously, as you say, they're so young. You know, things could be misdiagnosed and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. So it's a very much a diagnostic time in life, and not just nursery, but foundation stages as well. Um, coming from my own personal experience and from colleagues who work in and around Lisburn and MLD as well, um, the mental health challenges are huge. Um, there's a lot of communication issues with our early children. Um, I'm not saying technology is a bad thing, but it is having an impact okay. on, on our children. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that needs addressed. Um, but also the provision from health and joint working alongside um, the, the needs of our children I'm not saying it isn't there, but it's not there where it should be there or where it needs to be there. Mm -hmm. So you have children who would be referred for um, child and adolescent <coughs> mental health services, getting through to those, going <coughs> through clinical psychology. We, we can't always access that. Trust. Schools in our position should be able to have access to clinical psychology and psychiatry and so on. Um, as the children get older, obviously society has different impacts on them um, and so on and so forth. And our children, especially through an autistic spectrum, find it so hard to communicate their needs and identify emotions. How do we communicate? How, how do I talk to my parent? They, they don't necessarily can communicate about their emotions. They don't. They can't label the emotions, so it can be very much internalised, and that then can lead to harm or, or sort of very much depression in a lot of our older children. So they end up sitting in their bedroom, sitting at home um, after 19, not perfectly capable of entering the job world or uh, society in, in a different way, but they're just not in that place. So I think there has to be very much early intervention, but we also have to be able to access services very easily, and we're, we can't depend. Can I ask, why is, why is that then, that you can't access those clinical services? We can't have enough of them. Uh, and okay. we, we have no direct referral yeah. system. Okay. Um, I know we would go through our um, speech and language therapist in school for the one point of entry, and we can make referrals that way, um, and they take that onus on. They can't always do that. We would constantly be referring parents back to GP. Um, now, fair play to GPs, they do a cracking job, and they're, you know, we all know they're very um, much under pressure. But as, as the school, um, a special school estate moves forward, someone has to think proactively and think, what should this estate become? John Hunter did a lot of work years mm -hmm. ago on challenging behaviour and so on and so forth. We have a Professor Carpenter <coughs> talking to us as well. And you're looking at children who have never been in the education system before. They are coming through. We can't wait in three years until a school is built or four years until this is done. 
they are coming through, what should we be providing them? And it should be almost like a hub. Education is part of their life. It's not the only part. Some of our children, it is not the priority. They're not ready for school. And for those children with mental health issues, school is not the priority. They should maybe not be at school, but there should be additional provision, whether it be through IOTIS, whether it be through specific therapeutic <coughs> placements. Um, with health, and I know health do a lot of this. I'm not getting it healthy. They do a lot of really excellent work with our children. Um, but getting access to that's impossible at times and our, our special school estate should have open access to what our children need and we're happy to work with anybody to get that for children happy Very to work much. with anybody absolutely when we go you go right back into the identification of need we are not mental health specialists that is not what we are we are educational professionals and some of what we're talking about here is uh, children with very complex mental health issues mental health conditions coming into the school uh, into schools and we are not trained to meet their needs and it goes back to what you were saying about parts five and six of the statement that's non-educational need and truly there has to be somebody looking at non-educational needs and even the question as barbara has alluded to where should these pupils be educated if education is they cannot access education. Now that could be maybe just for a period until the mental health needs are looked at, until medication is looked at, and then they come back into education. There has to be some flexibility. And I think that's the key word in all of this, is flexibility. Um, I'm, I, I, and I, multidisciplinary working. I'm going to be honest, I like, enjoyed most of that answer, except the bit where we perhaps still look at mental health different from physical health, and I understand there are safety mm -hmm. considerations. Absolutely. Um, and and, and I, I, I totally get the, the, the training piece because we touched mm -hmm. on the training piece earlier on. Now, this one here will be slightly more prickly, but it is genuinely mm -hmm. something you'll be, you'll be faced with. At, you'll be asked by parents a lot, and certainly in the national debate, um, and it's in restraint and seclusion. Mm -hmm. And the reason I, ask, I want to talk about this is, is because the terminology of it is even to, to talk about it like that, my first uh, sort of input into restraint and seclusion was when I worked in the prison service in 1960, 1996, 1996, <laughs> 1996 to 2000, it feels like it was 1960. And we were talking about control, restraint, seclusion to deal with some of those violent, dangerous, not blaming you guys okay, at all, just thinking in terms of the terminology, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk nationally about methodology. Mm -hmm. And I declared an interest. My daughter's a learning disability nurse, so I want my daughter to stay safe. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what are your thoughts in terms of how we address this compassionately, mm -hmm. change what's happening too? Because I do think some of the methods and some of the the resources that are available perhaps aren't fit for the 21st century. I think we also, as a group of principals, 40 of us, not I don't think I'll leave anybody out in that, mm -hmm. would be very seriously concerned about what we have to occasionally. Yeah deliver in school. Mm -hmm. um, we have raised the question of restrictive practice, um, as have health. Yeah. We have taken advice from health on restrictive practice. Um, we have taken advice, we would use team teach um, in schools. Uh, we have taken advice from them, but it still is not answering our concerns and our questions. Um, I can only speak for my own school. We will have children who um, <coughs> we will try and not restrain in any shape or form sometimes that is the la well it is always the last um form but it's not always the most appropriate regardless um, it comes back to the school estate we need to have early intervention we need to have the right intervention we need to have multidisciplinary working as sharon has said from psychotherapists phys uh, psychology clinical psychology psychiatry mm -hmm. mental health workers um, and we also need spaces in our schools to allow those children to calm and regulate Appropriately, without anyone even having to touch them, um, they are not isolated. Um, none of us would use time out. None of us would, uh, you know, leave children or, uh, you know, place them in a room, um, unless it is in their best interest. And the paramountcy of the child in a special school is our governing factor, regardless of what we do. Or, or you know, it is imperative that that's understood. Um, parents are also concerned. They also have issues at home. Um, there is little or, or good advice out there for them as well and there are concerns they're very open um, about talking about it but in general if we had safe spaces for our children and we had the right um, accommodation we had the right professional 
people to go to. And we had the right <coughs> training. Um, we do have team teach training. EA provide that. We're very grateful for that. Um, but on the other hand, as Sharon said, we're educationists. We've come through teacher training education, not mental health training, not behavioural training per se. But we need other alternatives. But our, you know, our, our children will self-regulate in time. We mm -hmm. teach them, we help them, we support them at all times. Um, but they do need time and they need a safe environment, a safe space yeah. with flexibility of staffing. Yeah. With the most severe cases, um, we have we really need the input from the other professionals, particularly from health. Um, we need appropriate training. The team teach training is excellent. However, for some of our children, again, with more severe, challenging behaviours, that isn't sufficient. And to have the advanced team teach, you need access to six people to work with one child. We don't have that at any point in our schools, so we can't do that. I actually have someone trained in advanced team teach, but we can't access those processes. So we're working at the basic minimum. And it means that, I know as you were speaking about your daughter, our staff are being harmed daily. There is never a day when we don't have classroom assistants and teachers who are, are going home, haven't been bitten, kicked, slapped, punched, head-butted, mm -hmm. uh, maybe lumps of hair torn out. And they actually accept that this is part of their job, which it shouldn't be. No. That should not be part of anyone's job, and no one should be accepting that. But all of the staff in our mm -hmm. schools do accept mm -hmm. that, and they just see that as part of their role. But they shouldn't, because if we had the proper procedures, coming back to what Sharon was talking about, um, if we had the access to those health professionals, and schools were even like a dual purpose, where you had health and education working together, and where a child wasn't at the stage of being able to access their education yet, they could be working with the health professionals on the mental mm -hmm. health issues with input from education, then transition over into the education side with transition from health, and as the child needed to, they could move backwards and forwards, and they would have input from both health and education at all times. But one would take priority depending on the needs of the child, and that's something Absolutely. that we, look towards. You know, that we really that was, want to work towards. That was one of the recommendations of Dr um, Hunter's, Hunter's report, yeah. and um, where he actually... Um, Every special school in Northern Ireland fed into that report yeah. over a period of two weeks about the incidents. And I, I, I would like the committee to understand that um, there's a difference between, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm teaching my grandma to suck eggs, but there's a difference between a mental health issue and a psychiatric mm -hmm. disorder. An enduring mental health issue. An yes. enduring mental health issue. And we're talking about really complex children here. Um, and I also want to reassure the committee that with, within all of our schools, what we're looking at is we're looking at, have we the right communication strategies for each individual child? Yeah. Have we the right um, sensory integration? Uh, have, we, have we carried out a sensory assessment? Are we making sure that we have everything there to support that child? Do we recognise when they're going down into meltdown? Do we have structures and strategies in place for coping with that situation? So when we're getting into situations where staff are being um, hurt and children are self-harming, it is in the extremes. Mm -hmm. These are extreme situations where children are experiencing extreme mental health issues. And we I just need to finish briefly, Robbie. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, I have no more questions, Chair, other than to say that uh, I thank you for your, your, your candid responses to that. Um, um, uh, but I do believe that the, 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 the plan of action, like everything to do with mental health, is prevention is better yes. than intervention. Yes, that's what we're we're still in that phase of intervention because of um, the lack of early intervention, because we don't have those early years, because we've still Absolutely. only got 50%. Yeah. We'll take of note the three, we don't have the, the right training, and the therapeutic environment actually is a big, big part of that. Yes, yes. Yes. So I think, yeah, I think it, it, it focuses on the staff. I, I think, I, um, sorry to repeat myself, but the staff being trained appropriately, classroom assistants, I say, are excellent, but they are not trained. Our staff coming into special schools have no specialist training. Yeah. They can walk we, out of Stramillis, Coleraine, St Mary's, wherever they're coming mm -hmm. from, and they can walk into our schools and we train them. Absolutely. So our our time is spent training staff. There is no health worker would be walking in without training, but our staff do. 
and we train on the job from and, and our classroom assistance. I'd be eager for the committee to reconnect with you on this. I, I think that the absence of that training, the absence of the structures that you talk about, is leading not only to um, risk to uh, teachers, yeah, but also at times we've received accounts and allegations of risks to pupils as well yeah, as, as a result. Um, I, I think one clear thing is, and we'll be following up, is an urgent need for robust guidelines underpinned by legislation and resources and yeah. structures um, to ensure therapeutic response rather than inappropriate restraint and seclusion as well. Um, uh, that's definitely something this committee will, will follow up. Can I bring William Humphrey in? Thanks, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, ladies, for your presentation. And I might say so in particular to the three principals, to the job of work you do, and Adele and Daly, dealing with so many vulnerable young people. The um, question was asked earlier on in terms of the number of children having increased by 20% that have been uh, statemented for the last five, six years. I know I did hear the issue about health advance being one of the reasons for that, but maybe, Kim, could you answer, are there other reasons that are, that, that, that are um, delivering these figures? Uh, there are a range of reasons why children find themselves progressing through the, the code of practice. Um, you know, in terms of the number of children that we're finding with statements, um, I, I, I suppose there are a range of uh, medical um, learning um, issues, um, physical issues, disabilities, and so on that are there. I don't have. I suppose any evidence base as I sit here this morning to say this is absolutely the reason why we are seeing the increase that we are seeing, particularly in complex needs. Yes, we've talked about um, the advances in, in, in medicine, and there's absolutely no doubt that that um, leads to it, but, but I wouldn't be able to answer your question any more but than that at this stage. One um, of the things we, yeah. we heard last week is that the differential, that when the EA was formed in 2015, that there was a differential across the five boards in terms of the dealing with mm -hmm. the, the statementing process and how quickly mm -hmm. some of those boards um, uh, Processed that. I mean, this is hugely, hugely sensitive issue. I mean, you know, two sets of parents dealing with two young pupils that I've been dealing with recently, and the frustration, the the anguish that there is in the parents, uh, and the effect that it has mm -hmm. on, on on the child, but also the other children <coughs> in his or her classroom, uh, and the effect that that then has on the teacher, the classroom is a wider school estate. Yeah. It is, uh, yeah. And the fact that the, the, some of these children are quite prepared to do harm to themselves because they don't have the threshold in terms of pain or the understanding of the mm -hmm. risk mm -hmm. that other children have. So it does give me concern then that a report into 2017 suggests that 79% took longer than the 26 weeks. And at the moment, as we said, it's currently about 50%. I mean, I mean this, is, this is something which is very, very worrying. Um, Given the debacle that we had um, explained to us last week and which currently is ongoing, what is being done to address that? Well, as you know, and as I believe you heard last week, we have an improvement plan that has been put in place. It's been led by our Head of Transformation to look at a whole range of issues in and around addressing the statementing process, not only just looking at the timeframes, but looking at the administrative processes, looking at the resourcing issues, looking at ensuring there is consistency across the five offices and so on. So we are addressing that through an EA improvement plan at the moment. I mean, I am concerned listening to the principles about school estates and the, and the, and the, mm -hmm. uh, the current state and the, the projection in terms of development of schools as we go forward. I mean, I had uh, recently held a meeting with the EA department uh, and two schools in North Belfast, secondary schools. And they were looking at uh, projections of figures for 2023, when we went through them, frankly, I don't know where they got them from, but they were clearly not in any way relevant to what was actually happening on the ground. And I think we need to be very careful that when we're doing these projections, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I am pleased to hear that school principals <coughs> were taken into account in terms of doing that. But that's how we avoid the situations that we've heard explained mm -hmm. to us earlier. Mm -hmm. I accept that the more children going into special schools is higher, but if we do the projections uh, perhaps better, then we might be able to alleviate some of the appalling situations that we're hearing there. Um, 
In terms of joint upness, and you will be aware, this committee I, I proposed some weeks ago that this committee is going to have a joint meeting with the the, the health committee, and I think that's something which is very important. I, I very much agree with what you're. You were saying earlier in your assertion about joined upness, that is hugely, hugely important. Um, but could I just make the point in terms of listening to what Ms. Tennant said there in terms of they, they're educationalists, they're not specialists. Uh, however much they will put themselves uh, into situations that perhaps they, you know, they, they shouldn't or, or, or would prefer not to, they yeah. do that because of their professionalism and their decency and whatever dictates it. Do you believe that, that education, whether it's the department or the EA in Northern Ireland, takes enough specialist advice? For example, when we met the leadership of the special education leads um, people upstairs, there was talk of the, the Carpenter report, Professor Barry Carpenter. And I think um, countries, not only in the United Kingdom, but across Europe, have taken on board his advice and sought his advice and so on. Have we? I think one of the things that has come to light in terms of the work that we've been doing around the statementing is that we don't have enough of an evidence base across other jurisdictions to say, actually, this is how we believe we should be working with children with special educational needs right across the system, right from stage one through to, to stage five and, and, and through special schools. So we absolutely do need to begin there. And we need to begin to say, what is the evidence base of best practice telling us that we need to be doing? Because when you look right back to, I guess, the predictions um, of where the numbers that we thought that we would have coming through, I think it was probably sitting at around 1 or 2% as opposed to the percentage numbers that we're sitting at. So, so what are we doing differently? Is it because we're statementing um, children in a different way? Is it because we're not <coughs> taking um, the, the proper advices through, through health? Is, is there a different way of doing that? So, so, so that's the piece of work I think, I that think we absolutely need to look at to make sure that whatever we do moving forward, that we're doing it with the right evidence base behind us. I think, and, and I think you three ladies were part of the delegation we met, mm -hmm. but left with a clear, clear impression that we do not take advice from the likes of the Carpenter mm. Report uh, or specialists like him that perhaps there is too much of a reliance on specialism within, within. civil service mm -hmm. that may or may not be there. And that is not yeah. casting, uh, uh, you know, dispersions on the civil service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no <laughs> absolutely, around, but if we, if we can. People are moved around departments yeah. and build yeah. up a corpus mm -hmm. of information, but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean they're specialists. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I do think that Education Northern Ireland needs to take that specialist advice. Mm -hmm. I mean, could I maybe ask the, the, the ladies what their view is, because you're dealing with it on a daily basis professionally? Um, I do think there is a need to look more widely at the research that's going on mm -hmm. in other places and that is feeding into special education. I know um, since we met before, I think I had explained within the old southern region, our five special schools were having Barry Carpenter over to work with all of our staff, and we did that. But we invited some EA staff along to that day as well. And out so, of the, sorry, Paul, but you did that? Mm -hmm. We did that, you yes. You did that as head? As a group of five special schools. Not the EA. No. no. But we invited some EA staff along to that. And coming out of that, they have now asked Barry Carpenter to come and do some work with EA. Now, he is proposing to retire in June, mm -hmm. uh, which yes. would be a huge loss to everyone, and it's due to family circumstances. But I think he has agreed provisionally to do some work with EA, okay. um, involving mainstream schools as well, to do with special education. But you know there are others out there as well, Absolutely. like um, the Rochford report from um, Lady Rochford, you know, there's lots of things going on. There's lots of research happening. And we need to take account of all that. Mm -hmm. I think, just as you were saying, it is ourselves doing that. We're self-training. We are self. We are training our staff. Yeah. We're very open to working with anyone and taking advice from obviously DE and EA as appropriate. Um, we're more than happy, though, to work jointly with health or sorry, DE and EA because on the ground no one could know what goes on in our schools unless you came in you know it, it's a it's a very complex um, environment but we would be open to anything and to work with yes. people to try and 
would not advise. We are not experts. People say we are. We're not. We've learned on the ground like anyone else. But so that another generation of teachers and classroom assistants and children do not come through what we've had to come through and self-generate, there has to be proactive thinking here. There has to be. And just finally, can I just say, Kim, in relation to area planning, uh, across the piece, the, the, there must be a better and more efficient way of doing area planning to get to the point we need to get to in all of the school estate. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks William. Um, in, in closing, um, Kim, can I just ask very quickly, uh, attempts were made by the EA to reduce special school nursery hours to two and a half hours. We've heard recently the Minister consider okay. rationalising mainstream nursery provision to four and a half hours across the school estate. Can you give us an indication as to what the likely amount of hours will be for special school nursery hours coming out of the EA review? Uh, as, as you know, the EA review covers the six um, proposals. Um, the dual day nursery hours um, are, I, I suppose, they differ right across um, each of the individual nursery schools. But we haven't been able to move forward um, in the absence of a minister on that um, as yet. So I'm not able to give you any more information on that just okay. at this point, uh, Chris. But we okay. may be able to come back. Okay. Um, final, final point uh, that special school principals had been raising <laughs> with us as a committee was the need for greater employment and expenditure delegation to special school principals in, allowed, in order to allow them to be innovative and creative in their response to challenges. Hope maybe that's something you could come back to us on, but we're, we're very grateful for your presentation today, all of you. Thank you so much okay, indeed and you. for all the work you that you're much. doing uh, in our, our special schools across Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Okay, members, we're going to move to our next oral briefing. The clerk will summarise our actions after uh, the two briefings. We're hearing from the Department of Education with regards to special educational needs framework. Um, refer members to Clark cover note on page 97, send DE send framework briefing at page 108, key statistics at page 118, code of practice at page 119, and the DE response uh, to the Education and Health Send Cooperation Working Group at page 217, assembly research paper at 225, and draft equality and human rights policy screening at 230. I welcome Mr Ricky Irwin, the Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing at the Department of Education, and Sharon Lawler, Head of Special Education and Inclusion Review Team at the Department of Education. I invite you to make your opening remarks. <coughs> Thank you very much for being here today. Okay, thanks very much, Chair. Um, appreciate this opportunity to come to the committee and talk to you about the new special educational needs framework or the new SEND framework. So today we'll provide a bit of context for the framework and then talk you through the progress there's been since the department last came uh, on this matter on the 18th of January 2017. Uh, I will also update you on our plan next steps. You will recall that the minister came to the committee on the 29th of January and mentioned the increasing SEND pressures for schools and the need for additional resources. And you'll also recall that ahead of the 29th of January meeting, there was a short paper provided uh, on SEN. The paper you received to accompany this session today provides some more detail on that. The focus of the new SEN framework is on inclusion, early intervention and assessment, leading to interventions designed to ensure that children and young people with SEN have access to the special educational provision they need when they need it. And that is underpinned by clear, understandable information. So the new SEND framework comprises of three building blocks, namely the Special Educational Needs and Disability Act 2016, the SEND Act, the new SEND regulations, and a new code of practice, which will provide the practical guidance for schools, the education authority and others for identifying, assessing, and making provision for children who have SEND. Awareness raising and training for schools and others in the new SEND framework are also key aspects in bringing forward the new framework. The SEND Act received royal assent on the 23rd of March 2016, and when fully commenced it will introduce a range of new duties to be placed on the EA, Board of Governors and Health Authorities. Members who have been provided with us have been provided with a synopsis of the main content of the new Act ahead of our briefing today. So in brief, the Act will bring in a new duty for the EA to listen to the views of the child. It will strengthen the cooperation between education and health 
in the identification, assessment and provision for children who have or may have SEN. And key work has already been taken forward to improve cooperation between EA and health and social care trusts. Each school will be required to have a learning support coordinator, and this is the new name for the Special Educational Needs Coordinator, or SENCO. And every child for whom special educational provision is being made is to have a personal learning plan, or PLP. Children over compulsory school age are to be given their own rights, and a new right of appeal at annual review of statements is to be introduced. The Act also requires greater independence from the EA for the Dispute and Resolution Service and the introduction of a new independent mediation service, which is seen as a viable and less stressful option to the formal appeal process for parents or children over compulsory school age if they're not happy with the EA's decisions regarding statutory assessment. The new independent dispute and resolution service called DARS which parents can use, has been up and running since September last year. The EA will be required to produce an annual plan of its arrangements for special educational provision, which will contribute to a more open and transparent approach to how it determines the same services it will provide and what services are available, and importantly, how to access those services. This plan will also detail the training that's available for school staff. The majority of provisions within the Act need to be commenced, with any further commencement linked to the new regulations and the associated code of practice. The current 2005 SEN regulations will be replaced. Previously, a public consultation was launched in 2016 on the draft regulations as they were at that time. A summary of consultation responses was published in January 17 and departmental officials presented to the committee, as I said, in January 2017 on the 18th. Since then, we've taken the opportunity afforded to us to really concentrate on what was not working and indeed how we could change the draft regulations to improve <coughs> things. We have made considerable changes to refine and finalise the regulations in liaison with the departmental solicitor's office. A synopsis of the new draft regulations at a very high level, summarising the main changes since the 2016 consultation version was provided at Annex B to your written paper. I'll just set out a few of those main changes for you now. The statutory time frame for the EA to make an assessment and, if necessary, make a statement has been tightened from 26 weeks to 22 weeks. In the 2016 consultation version, it was 20 weeks, which included a four-week turnaround for Health and Social Care Trust to provide their advice. But we listened to feedback from the trusts and changed this back to six weeks in absolute agreement with them that four weeks just would not work for them. We've made an improvement to the 2005 SEN regulations, which, will, uh, which do allow exceptions to those time limits for both the EA and health trusts. While the draft regulations still per permit exceptions, they importantly introduce new upper time limits by which the EA must absolutely complete each step in the statutory assessment process. This represents a sea change improvement and will bring to an end statutory assessments taking months or in some cases years longer than they should. Following the finalisation of the regulations with DSO in December 19, we have finalised a new code of practice. This will replace both the 98 code and the 2005 code supplement currently in use in schools. It will provide statutory guidance on how the legislation will work in practice for schools, the EA and other partner bodies such as health. A key driver in the development of the code has been the 2017 Audit Office report, which recommended that the Department and the EA should ensure that schools apply a consistent and clear approach to identifying and providing for children with SEN. With this in mind, the Code sets out individual roles and responsibilities and offers step-by-step -step guidance for addressing the needs of those children who have or may have SEN. This is supplemented by the use of practical flowcharts, checklists and other summary information that will be a go-to resource for schools. The draft code has been developed in collaboration and engagement with a range of stakeholders, including schools, the Education Authority, SENCO cluster groups, the ETI and other statutory and non-statutory organisations. Some key issues addressed by the new code include 
a reduction from five stages within the existing code to three stages of special educational provision. So that would be firstly the school, secondly the school plus support from the EA, and then finally provision through a statement. Other issues addressed include greater cooperation between the EA and health and social care trusts, detailed information about what will be entailed for the new role of the learning support coordinator, support that children over compulsory school age can have to exercise their rights, <coughs> guidance for schools in preparing, reviewing and maintaining a child's personal learning plan, which will be held electronically in a secure system. And this will replace the existing individual education plans, which are not standardised at all and are held in many and varied formats at present. The Department recognises the importance of investing and training for schools to help improve, introduce the framework and support its implementation. As such, we have funded the setting up of a SEND implementation team in the EA. This team has already delivered a significant awareness and training programme to school principals and SENCOs, and further training is underway and planned to ensure that both the EA and schools are ready to implement the new SEND framework. For the 1920 financial year, the funding provided to the EA SEND team was 2.5 million. And although, although budgets have not been agreed for next year, ideally we would like to maintain this level of funding for the 2021 year, and that's subject to the Minister's approval. It's especially important to support SENCOs, who, as I've already mentioned, will be known as learning support coordinators. The Department has therefore provided the EA with funding to facilitate necessary subcover for SENCOs on training days and also for in-school work. This will ensure that SENCOs are fully informed and allow time in school to embed the new statutory requirements, including transitioning their pupils over to the new SEND framework. The Department has also worked with nursery, primary, post-primary and special school SENCOs to co-design new standardised personal learning plan electronic templates, which will be implemented as part of the school's existing School Information Management System, or SIMS. So before moving to the next steps, I would just like to highlight the rising challenges, as you've heard, in relation to SEN. Um, during the last 15 years, the education sector has seen a huge change in both the numbers of children being identified as having SEN, from 53,000 in 0405 to 78,000 in 1819, and the numbers of children with SEN being taught in mainstream settings, which has increased significantly from around 14% of the total enrolment in mainstream schools in 0405 to 21% in 1819. The latest statistics announced just recently on the 27th of February show children with SEN in our schools sitting at around 67,000. I'll talk about that in a minute. Work during the last three years has included the development and implementation of contemporary and meaningful SEN and medical categories, delivery of the associated training, and changes to SEN registers made by staff in schools. This work has been supported by departmental guidance and training by the EA, and places a renewed focus on accurately recording the SEN of pupils in our schools, resulting in the removal of a number of unclear SEN categories, as well as the existing SEN register, which all schools must have. It has also introduced a new electronic version of the medical register. This now means that children with a medical diagnosis who do not have a special educational need will be recorded on the medical register only. The official 2019 school census figures released on the 27th of February have shown a reduction in the numbers of children at stage one, which is a direct reflection of the SEN and medical categories work. So, for example, the combined numbers of children at stage one across primary and post-primary school is reduced from 14,000 in 1819 to around 8,700, which is a reduction of about 40%. We do recognise the implementation of the SEN framework will bring associated increased pressures for schools, and we've highlighted a £30 million pressure as part of the ongoing Budget 2021 information gathering exercises. This pressure relates to funding for the new learning support coordinators and for the creation of the new personal learning plans required for every child on the SEN register. It recognises that schools do not currently receive specific funding for the special educational provision for children at the current stages one to four of the Code of Practice, and they also have to fulfil their responsibilities for children with statements. As significant changes have been made to improve the regulations 
It is our intention, subject to ministerial agreement, to further consult on these alongside the new draft code of practice. However, before we embark on a consultation, the draft regulations and code have issued to colleagues in the EA for final consideration, and we anticipate receipt of their final comments very soon. I briefly touched on the fact that most of the provisions in the Act are yet, yet to be commenced. In the main, for practical purposes, these can only be commenced when all the building blocks of the new sound framework are in place. We do, however, intend to commence the duty of the EA to have regard to the views of the child around the same time as we consult on the draft regulations and the new code. This refers to Section 1 of the SEND Act 2016, and I'm sure you'll agree that the views of the child are one of the foundation stones on which we build the rest of the new SEND framework. So, Chair, in conclusion, um, we look forward to working with the Committee as we move forward with this uh, vital piece of work around the new SEND framework. Um, hopefully you find some of that helpful today. Sharon and I are happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks, Ricky. Uh, there is a, a fair bit of detail there that we'll want to review. Uh, I do sincerely hope that that is a, a pathway to significant improvement. Um, you'll be aware, obviously, that the <coughs> EA uh, visited the committee last week to issue an apology for the systemic failing of the administration and the management of the EA SEND statement in process. The Department of Education has been reviewing the SEND framework for more than 10 years, so I, I appreciate you're not the minister who was invited to come today. I appreciate you're, you're new into this post as well, but you are representing the department. So what responsibility does the Department of Education take for that systemic failing in the SEND statement in process? I think in my short time in this role, uh, this has become the key issue for the department. It's a priority. Um, there's been a lot of work in terms of trying to bring forward a new policy and legislative response, um, and that's the work that Sharon and her team have been leading since the passing of the legislation in 2016. There's been a huge amount of work that's been going on with the EA in terms of trying to address some of the issues that have um, emerged. It would be my intention as the Director with policy responsibility for special education within the department to make sure that we hold the EA to account on these very serious issues. Um, in my short time, I've spoken to a number of school principals, leaders, and teachers, and some of what I've heard is completely unacceptable and, in fact, disturbing at times uh, and upsetting. It's our duty and our responsibility to get this right because children with SEN are some of the most vulnerable children in our school uh, education system. And some of these matters here are very, very complex and cannot be solved just within my area. It requires us working very closely with the area planning teams, with the infrastructure and capital teams, with the education authority, and most importantly, with the schools and the school leaders. So it would be my intention as we move forward um, to make sure that we do hold the EA to account on everything that has been identified, um, that we continue to engage with school leaders uh, and parents and pupils on the ground, and that we put in place a system that will avoid this happening again. Has the Department of Education failed to hold the Education Authority to account? There are existing governance and accountability mechanisms there. Um, I couldn't comment on their uh, effectiveness. All I can comment on is what I have seen in relation to uh, children who have special educational needs and what I have heard on the ground. And it's very clear that the current position cannot be sustained and must be addressed immediately. Why can't the Department of Education vouch for the effectiveness of its governance and accountability mechanisms in relation to the Education Authority? Chair, I'm conscious that the Minister and the Permanent Secretary are coming okay. to this committee next week and there may be questions that others are better placed to answer. Okay. Well, what, what is your assessment of the adequacy of the Education Authority response to the systemic failure? So I understand that uh, work is underway within the EA. I haven't seen the improvement plan which Kim refers to. We have, however, uh, however, met with the Chief Executive just yesterday. Um, it is the Department's intention to be 
uh, in the middle of the governance structure in terms of oversight of delivery of the actions in that, over, in that improvement plan. Um, I think the Chief Executive has committed to come back to this committee with more detail around uh, what will be taken forward. Um, it will be my intention that we uh, follow that very closely uh, and what I would like to see would be a marked improvement in terms of some of the key performance metrics that exist around the number of weeks it takes to uh, produce a statement in terms of statutory assessment uh, and also the numbers who are waiting longer than the statutory 26 week period. Do you think this approach has the ability to restore public confidence in the Education Authority? I think from a department's perspective, it, it is our duty to do that. Whether it restores confidence in the public, that will only be seen by uh, improving the outcomes for the children and young people that the system is designed uh, to serve. But the Department of Education believes no further independent review is necessary of the Education Authority at this time? It wouldn't be for me to make a judgment on on an issue of that significance. Okay, fair enough. In terms of the, the average waiting time for assessments, which is obviously what the new framework will seek to improve, um, 2016 to 17, 42 weeks, 2017, 18, 47 weeks, 2018, 19, 47 weeks, with some improvement, I understand from 2019 to date of 34 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, what is what is your assessment of the acceptability of those average waiting times for each of the last four years? Well, I think they're unacceptable. Uh, I think that uh, urgent work needs to be taken forward. I think what we're doing today in terms of presenting to you on the new SEND framework is part of the department's overall response to try and really put in place <coughs> the right legislative underpinning that's required to allow the EA to make the improvements that it needs. So I talked at the beginning about reducing the time frame, the statutory time frame from 26 weeks to 22 weeks. The legislation also strengthens the requirements of the health and the health and social care trusts in relation to cooperating with the EA and the department on meeting the needs which are non-educational and are in relation to children with SEN. Um, there are a range of other activities which we will be taking forward in terms of the sharing of information, um, trying to standardise templates, trying to reduce the paperwork and bureaucracy, trying to make it easier for school principals in terms of trying to access services. There's a huge programme of work, a lot of which has happened, uh, a lot of which still has to happen and it's as I see it, my responsibility within the department to make sure that it does. Okay, and the new, the new statutory term will be 22 weeks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, for for four, each of the last four years there, we had average, and this is only average, waiting times of up to 47 weeks. Why, why were there no consequences? Why did that not alert the Department of Education to take action? Why did it get to the point of whistleblowing and an internal audit before any action was taken? I suppose I'll be honest, Chair, I, I, I can't answer that. Okay, um, well, I, reframe I, it then. What, what new processes will be inserted to avoid that lack of accountability for such exaggerated average <clears throat> waiting times to not happen again? So a, a lot of this will depend on the operational improvements that the EA puts in place. Uh, and the difference that they make, and the way that we oversee that, and how we take assurance as a department that those improvements are made. And I see that happening through evidence, through a measurement of timescales, through the numbers that are involved. So it's important from my point of view that we have the right information coming forward from the EA at the time that we need it that says, here's how they're performing across the entire statutory assessment process. The SEND Act, the SEND regulation, SEND code of practice, vitally important to, to improving this system. Mm -hmm. You say it's been issued to EA for consultation. Mm -hmm. Given everything that we've just said, mm -hmm. who in EA is providing you with feedback on how to improve a system that they have just found to be systemically failing to administer? 
Um, well, we we sent it to EA, but um, we went to senior directors, um, and uh, we have received feedback from the SEND implementation team. We have also been working with other colleagues throughout EA. We've just, to be honest with you, we've received the comments on the regulations only. The code of practice, we haven't received any comments, but the last bits of the code of practice went to the EA uh, last week. There's uh, 14 sections in a series of annexes. Um, so we're, we, I understand that the first six uh, <coughs> sections of the code they are ready to give us those comments uh, on, on those. I'll, I'll finish my questions here as well. A significant aspect of the difficulty with the administration and management of the, the SEND statement and process appeared to be the valid exceptions. Mm -hmm. it, it, will this new framework improve the, the valid exception reasons and reduce uh, their their use uh, to contribute to undue and unnecessary delay? So I'll let Sharon explain in more detail, but there will still be valid exceptions. However, the key difference now will be there will be upper time limits at every stage. So rather than, than an open-ended process, which at the minute means that if a child is going through the statement process and the education authority has asked for advice from health and health have come back and said <coughs> we need more time that just lasts indefinitely under the new legislative framework <coughs> there will be a time limit by which they must respond <coughs> yes that's absolutely right <coughs> basically the new upper time limit came out of um, us sitting down with departmental solicitors and looking at <coughs> what was wrong and uh, uh, with the current law, the 2005 regulations. In particular, yes, you're right about exceptions. That will still be part of, um, and that's something that you know, when it comes before you as committee, when we start to talk about this in detail, you'll be interested in what the exceptions are. But in particular, these new upper time limits have come in because we need to close off the process in terms of if a valid exception is claimed, there needs to be uh, an, a, an end date by which the EA and indeed health within that provide their advices. That will be a new statutory duty, uh, new duties plural on the EA and on the health trusts by which they must complete. That's judicially reviewable. So that's your change. That's your significant change in terms of the process. I'd, I'd be, I'll move on. I'd, I'd be keen to hear your how cooperation between EA and health trusts regarding provision of multidisciplinary support in special schools is going to be improved. Maybe that can be covered in other questions. Can I bring uh, William Humphrey in, please? Thanks, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> Sharon, I've listened there. Uh, you've heard from the EA about regulations only, but nothing in terms of the code of practice. Is that what you say? Well, this is just a preliminary thing before we go out to consult. This is a courtesy, basically, that we're letting them see the last uh, versions. They have been working with us on the Code mm -hmm. of Practice. In fact, some of the sections, their specialists have contributed to those. So it's not that they won't have seen How it. How long is that working for, ongoing? Uh, the work on the Code of Practice. The, uh, the Code of Practice has been finalised. We've been finalising it from December. Uh, our DSO, Departmental Solicitors, were working with us on the regulations. We had a number of solicitors who have been working with us, but from March last year to December, we had a series of 14 millions with Departmental Solicitors, all focused on improving the regulations for the situation of the child getting provision when they needed it. That was our whole focus. So that's what we're bringing, we'll are we be bringing to you as a change. And was this driven by the debacle in the EA? Was this driven by the mm. debacle? What driven? The work with DSO? The, all of the, 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 all the of work this. we've been talking about here mm. in terms of the presentation, has it been driven? Because you, you, the department, was aware of the problems that, that, that no, were going? Uh, no, this, this started, um, you know, uh, I think it was chair alluded to the fact that the SEND framework had been discussed and work has been going on. 2012, the executive took a decision regarding the policy and the way forward. Then the SEND Act came as an implementation of that. 2016. 2016, sorry. Oh, sorry, the SEND saying? Act was 2016, but you're right. That, that was, yeah. 2012 was 2012 when, when you started. 2016. Yep, yep, I maybe yep. said the wrong dates there. No, no, but you were right. You were right. 2016 was when the Act came. 
then we presented to the House the, the, the draft regulation. Well, actually, we consulted. We consulted on the draft regulations in 2016. We got a, a, a lot of response on that. We also, this committee, also had stakeholder engagement, and we got response. And we started to look at the changes and to that. Then the Assembly went down. Yep. Um, so basically, we were looking at a situation of we had we didn't know we were going to be left with three, you know three years. To, to work on this, but we've used that time frequently. We have notification referral and statutory assessment project, which we'll talk at, at another stage, or, or you know very shortly, um, where we looked at the statutory assessment process, working with health and EA, and improving that interaction between them. Mm. You, you were both here for the previous evidence session, and, and I therefore wasn't. you oh, were you not. Sorry. Oh no, listening to the last yeah. session. Oh, that yes. one. Yes. yes. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and and in terms of the the. Uh, uh, <coughs> principles, you would have heard very clearly them saying that there needs to be a greater joined up, joined upness between health and education around these issues. Yeah. I, mean, I, I asked you this question a few weeks ago, Ricky, and you, you were saying that there is a better joined yeah. upness. Yeah. But, but can you reassure this committee that all is being done that is possible to ensure that when a new school is being designed or a, a school is being upgraded, that the health is coming in in terms of advice, but also in terms of LSD when it's needed as well, if possible? Well, I, 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 can't, I can't give that reassurance because it goes beyond my <clears throat> area of competence in the department in terms of capital bills and area planning. Mm. I know that colleagues <clears throat> from the area planning side are due to come and brief the committee on the entire area planning process. So, <clears throat> Sorry, that might be the better... They might be better okay. place to do that. Could I finally just say, then, in terms of the um, <coughs> internal audit that was carried out by the, the uh, EA, but not by the, in, the EA's own internal audit team. Um, I've been speaking to people who work in the EA since last week and have had contact with some education principals who are involved in that sector. Morale is very, very low. Um, people feel their, their, their honesty, integrity, their professionalism have been challenged around these, these issues. Um, can I just ask, in terms of the figures which the Chair said out earlier, mm. in terms of the statutory timescales, 26 weeks, given that we heard uh, a number of, week, number of weeks ago that health, the response from health can be, can be long and protracted at times, is it the Department's view that the 26 weeks, which is 26 weeks of complete and utter um, stress, for schools, in terms of teachers and principals, in terms of parents, and in terms of um, the, the, the child themselves. And the stress and anxiety is massive during those 26 weeks, and you'd obviously want to get it below 26 weeks, but being realistic, mm. is 26 weeks deliverable and doable in terms of the, the, the figures that we've had? I mean, is it, I mean, what I'm basically saying is, the department comfortable that 26 weeks is the right figure? Can it be improved upon, or is there, is there need to be some uh, reality check around the whole thing? So the new law will bring that down to 22 weeks. <coughs> that has passed. Excuse me, um, <coughs> um, but it just hasn't commenced yet. Um, <coughs> it will depend very much on the improvements that the EA puts in place. It will also depend on the level of cooperation between health and education, uh, and it will require it will depend on the capacity within the, health, within the health sector to respond to requests from the EA for advice around individual children. So there are a number of factors there, um, <clears throat> which will come into play. I would like to think that, based on what we've heard and the need for change, that we will be able to meet the 22-week <coughs> sorry <coughs> time frame. Um, but we will have to keep a very close eye on that. Can I ask a brief summary? Anyway? What, what's the statutory um, deadline <coughs> under jurisdictions? Oh, I don't know. So I, I, I couldn't make you out. I'm sorry. I heard what, you say statutory. <coughs> what is the statutory deadline in <coughs> other jurisdictions for the assessment of special educational um, needs? A, a, 
can't answer you. Maybe you could come back. You come back. We can check that. Okay. Okay. Chair, sorry, could I just supplement what I've been saying if I can actually get it out? (laughs) Take your time. I don't don't know what's happening here. Ricky, to be honest, (laughs) (laughs) just (laughs) dry through when I'm trying to talk. It's really bad timing. Um, I'll tell you what it is, right? You're leaving the room. I'm leaving the room. It's not back here. No. Um, um, an important part, part of what we have to do is the legislative and the policy framework, but another part of what we've been doing is trying to respond to the complaints that we've heard in relation to the level of communication with parents on where they are in the process, the quality of the information, their ability to understand the letters that they get from the EA, um, <clears throat> and how quickly and timely they receive those letters. So, <clears throat> I have a series of recommendations um, which will mostly be for the EA to bring forward in relation to improving the entire communication process with parents. It's simply not acceptable that when they get a letter, it's out of date, they can't understand it. In fact, even the use of letters at this, in this day and age we need to look at. We need to look at having a more up-to-date parent portal for how mm-hmm. so a parent can actually go online and see exactly where they are in the statementing process. Um, in my view, they should have uh, an assigned caseworker within the EA so they know who to ring and how to ring them. Um, uh, and there should also be central advice for schools and SENCOs in terms of uh, online resources and they know where to go within the EA or online for help with individual cases. So that whole stream of work around what we call the CN Learner Journey has been going on for about the past six to nine months. I have a set of recommendations there. I will be feeding those into the EA and saying, as part of your improvement plan, these are the other things that I want to see addressed as part of this, and I'll be holding you to account on that. Okay. Can I just say very briefly, sorry. William? Yeah, thanks. <coughs> I, I wish you and the EA well with the 22 weeks because we've all dealt with parents who presented themselves uh, <coughs> in our offices around these issues, and I hope that is acceptable. <coughs> Mm-hmm. except that a law has been passed and all of that. Mm-hmm. It's very important we don't create an expectation for people that these things will happen quicker and then they're, they're unrealistic, they're not deliverable, and, and then that will only lead to greater frustration uh, in the system. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Robin, you want yeah, to ask a supplementary? Just, it is just a supplementary, Chair. It, it, <coughs> you heard William refer to the uh, need for cooperation between health and uh, education. Within the synopsis of the Act that we have here, and this might be stronger within the Act, but it refers to the Act will strengthen the cooperation between education and health. Mm-hmm. Is is that sufficient, do you think, that it will strengthen it as opposed to be a bit you more specific? In the <coughs> well, the, the bit that we're referring to is already really being strengthened in terms of the SEND Act. There are two particular sections in the SEND Act that cover cooperation regarding identifying, assessing and providing and for children in terms of the have a statement as well for transition. Um, specifically, uh, there's going to be a new duty on the EA to shall, during the statutory assessment process to ask health there would be a new duty on health to respond and that will be within as we mentioned in the regulations within particular time frames and the uh, new duties in regard to that but you'd be interested to to note um that the specifically um it does identify that any relevant treatments or service likely to be of benefit in addressing the special educational needs of the child that the health and service so, social services authority as the trust uh, during the t- statutory assessment process that they name as being of benefit and if it's something that they normally provide that they uh, should provide it that's in the send act and that would be supplemented further with the regulations so really cooperation has been elevated mm-hmm. um, because, you know, around the time of 2016, you remember the Cooperation Act just before that. So the Assembly took, you know, basically put in strengthened uh, sections within the SEND Act. And we have been working with health on that notification referral, statutory assessment, and EA on improving that interface. And just last, just January past, the final templates, uh, which our uh, provision of information coming in in TEA uh, have been implemented. That's community paediatricians, OT, physio and speech and language. The last bit of the jigsaw 
which will make a big difference to the, the time frames in terms of those health devices coming, is electronic sharing. So what we have at the moment is still a paper-based request going off to EA. That takes time to get there. Health are scanning that on, the information about the child, then sending within their systems. Health also have about 20 different systems to cover, mm. believe it or not, which is being replaced by one called Encompass. The information coming back is coming back by post in terms of, of the, the templates. That is affecting the time scales. There is absolutely no joy. So on our radar and the SEND steering group, which Ricky chairs, is this electronic sharing. Um, uh, and we really can't wait any longer. We need this to be solved. If I could okay. add to that, if I'm able to get yeah, it out. I just ask, put people asking questions and officials respond, try to be as concise as we possibly can. I realise there's a lot to get through here, but okay. appreciate um, it. Thanks just very, very much. Just very quickly add, <clears throat> in terms of what Sharon has just explained there, the new law also <clears throat> requires that there will be an inspection of the level of cooperation between health and education, and that inspection will be carried out by both the RQIA and the Education and Training Inspectorate. So there has to be a joint plan, which the EA and Health put in place, and there has to be regulation through inspection of how effective that joint plan will be. Okay. Uh, can I, the, 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 the very short, the, the, the point you made, Ricky, <coughs> about contact between the parent of the child being assessed and an individual, I think is a major step forward, if that can be mm -hmm. achieved. Thank you. Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and welcome back, Ricky. Uh, thank you, Sharon, for your presentation. Could you just for a second clarity, could you explain what, the rem what your remit actually is as a director? So the Inclusion and Wellbeing Directorate includes policy responsibility for children with SEN, health and wellbeing, newcomer children, anti-bullying, safeguarding and child protection arrangements, a range of others which escape me right now, but they're, they're the primary ones. How long are you in the role? It's the beginning of December. Okay. And Sharon, what, what's your remit? Um, I'm looking after <coughs> the, this new SEN framework, which was taking the SEN Act through the Assembly, okay. the drafting of the regulations, and a code of practice and a series of projects like the notification for a Saturday assessment room and other ones. So my remit is on the new world, on the new stuff that we're bringing in to try and think, make things better. How long are you in post? Oh, <laughs> I have been, I was brought back into this area in 2016 because I took through, I was bill team leader during a direct rule for special educational needs and disability order. That was mine. So that's my expertise. So I'm a le my expertise is in the legislation and so on. Two very important uh, and significant roles of authority. I'm sure you both agree. Um, what, what we are learning and continue, I say learning because we're continuing to learn about the systemic failure that exists when it comes to children with special educational needs. And uh, it should come as a great shock to everybody, unless people were in the know about it for quite some time. But, Ricky, you've said earlier, and I don't want to misquote, the department will continue to hold the EA to account. Mm -hmm. Continue to, mm -hmm. <coughs> in relation to these matters. It's clear that the <coughs> department was doing everything but holding the education authority to account. And really big questions need to be posed about the lack of governance around how EA have managed to get away with what they've got away with in terms of children being failed for such a prolonged period of time. Now, I recognise you're in post since December, but there needs to be questions asked about the lack of governance around these procedures and how they were allowed to get so out of control. And again, I'll pay, I'll pay tribute to the whistleblower that brought the bulk of the revelations to the fore in terms of the media about how depressing and shocking the failures were. And the failures aren't unique to the Education Authority, and this committee gave a very tough session to the Education Authority in recent weeks. But they're not guilty in isolation. 
the Department for Education is also guilty of failing children with special educational needs. And I think, as I said to them, if we're to move forward from this square that we're on, that has to be recognised absolutely that there was a systemic failure and the children were failed as a consequence of a lack of government, a lack of oversight. And obviously, some people asleep at the wheel in relation to this area. The other thing is, we're, we're talking about what we can do now and what we can go do in the future. This framework has been worked on for 10 years, is that right? Um, yes. yes, but it took a twist and turn in 2012 because it changed considerably. It must have taken quite a few twists and turns to last 10 years. Well, we've had a three-year period yes, as well. And yeah. Yes, but even so, and I cannot even begin to imagine the level or numbers of children that have been failed in that process because it has been so prolonged with obvious reasons at certain points. But Ricky, there needs to be a recognition by the department that there was a failure on the department's part. And on each of the occasions this week, when my colleague, the chair of this committee and others, including my own party colleague, Justin McNulty, Karen Mullen, William Humphreys and others, have outlined some of the concerns. And some of the rest of us have also called for a fully independent review. Given your position, I don't accept that you cannot recognise the need for an independent review of EA, given the seriousness and scale of the failures. So I don't accept you saying to the Chair, Ricky, that you cannot answer that. You're in a very strong, both of you, in a very strong and significant position of authority. And I don't buy the past the buck situation in relation to vulnerable children. Now, you're only in the role since December, Ricky, that's fine. But I'm not going to accept people saying that I can't answer that question because it's of a higher nature than I. These are in positions of authority. There needs to be recognition that there needs to be a fully independent review given what's happened. But the department needs to take some responsibility for what has happened as well. And I think that needs to be very clearly put. Okay, thank you, Chair. It's more of a point than okay. a question. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, Karen Mullen, Deputy Chairperson. Thank you, Ricky and, Sh and Sean, for coming in. Um, because of the time, we're probably not going to get to answer ha or ask half the questions, but we'll save them for the Minister for next week. But um, given it has already been raised that for the last 10 years now, um, uh, this review has been ongoing, um, given the last update that I got from the Department in relation to this end legislation and moving forward, that everything is sitting ready for a Minister to come in. And I asked you how long uh, this next period of consultation um, is going to take and how long do you anticipate it will take for the statutory requirements under the framework to be embedded in the schools? If I start, maybe Sharon <coughs> can finish. So uh, on Friday, actually, uh, the entire package of the new draft regulations and code of practice was passed by us to the, to the Permanent Secretary and the Deputy Secretary for review. Um, it will then go to the, the Minister for approval for the consultation to start, so it would be our very clear intent <coughs> that that consultation will commence in April and will last uh, the standard eight-week period, uh, although we may need to lengthen that for holidays. Sure. We'll adjust probably for, uh, if we straddle the <coughs> school holidays for Easter, we'll probably adjust in that two weeks on to that, so it'll probably be ten weeks. In terms of your question, we will then analyse the responses um, come back to the committee uh, with our views on those. We would expect um, to be coming to the committee with uh, suggested changes to the draft regulations. That would be in September, and then you would be taking them uh, uh, basically under your, your notice in terms of scrutiny. That would be your role, your scrutiny role. You would probably be involved in uh, stakeholder engagement yourselves. So I would imagine that you know if we start about mid-September in terms of that yourselves taking the regulations to, um, you know, it'll depend <laughs> how long that will take, how many times you have us up. But I would imagine we could be in December then in a situation where you're turning around and saying to the House, right, we're, we're ready to 
you know, these are the changes that we're recommending to these regulations. We will then work with our departmental solicitors, uh, looking at those changes, etc. And then you'll be the official term is making them then, making the regulations in the assembly. Once those are made, um, the code of practice, then the regulations and the send act, we'll be looking at commencement orders in terms of, of, of these actual things. Commencement of the regulations, commencement of specific duties. Um, we've already outlined, we're mentioning views of the child. They're not dependent on the regulations. Other ones are. Um, so we'll be starting looking at commencement. Uh, we're even turning our attention to that and have been for some time. So as soon as the regulations are made, that's when we need to have a series of commencement orders for the various um, provisions within the Act. At least an hour year. Well, 20, uh, it would be Jan January we would be starting some of those commencements. It depends how quickly the regulations are made. That, that, that's a pivotal yeah. point in terms of Everybody involved in that process ought to be trying to progress that as a matter of urgency, but yeah. do it right, obviously. Yeah. I just want to ask a few other questions. Is, is there a policy or framework um, for ASD provision in, in mainstream schools? Um, so... <coughs> Autism spectrum disorder is a medical diagnosis. Uh, however, children who are diagnosed with ASD may have a SEN as a result of that diagnosis. So, I can I ask just specifically around autism units? Then? Uh, yeah. The EA does EA, have. It's the EA yeah. has, in terms of your thinking of learning support centres, yeah. yes. I maybe think you're thinking, thinking of. Autism yes. specific classes do yes, exist do. within mainstream classes. Yes. No, I know they do. Is, yes. there, is there a policy for EA? EA uh, are reviewing that policy, I understand at present. So, uh, you know. I don't know whether you can answer this. Um, why does autism provision, it starts in key stage one, stops in key stage two, provided again in key stage three, and then it stops in key stage four. And I've been told that children then in key stage four are being absorbed and the mainstream <coughs> school. We heard this morning from special school leaders on here saying mainstream schools do not have the resources or infrastructure to be able to cope or provide uh, educational outcomes or that support for young people. We're clearly hearing from mainstream principals and leaders exactly the same thing. They're not being given the resources um, and they're required then to provide um, the educational provision without it. I think the, the review that Kim talked about earlier in terms of special education includes the autism specific classes and the learning support classes within mainstream. So. From what I've seen of limited material, there is a recognition that there are gaps in provision, both in terms of age and geography, uh, which they are currently considering. So in key stage four, they're just expected to go back on, and with being in a unit, they're expected to go back on the mainstream class, and the school is not given the resources. And uh, uh, two schools in my area, St Bridget's and Listening, have autism units, two, two excellent schools, have um, stepped forward to do the best that they can do. They are two non-selective schools that compete on all our issues. Um, they are not getting the support. They have to fight. E EA has, you know, came, asked them to do it, and when they do do it, EA then is not stepping up. They're saying they can't even, the communication is awful. Ricky, you described it earlier, and you talked about the letters. There's letters brought into my office, and the children's names aren't even accurate. They're not the right name that's on the letter. So how does that feel for a parent who's been waiting 100 weeks for a statement that EA can't even get the, the name of their child correct? Um, principals uh, are very, very angry. We're sitting with two units that's full the capacity, and the two schools are not being given the support or the resources to be able to uh, provide that. And their Board of Governors are now talking about you know, maybe not doing that anymore, taking away. So we will sit, and in, in my city, we won't have that, if that's the case. They're very, very frustrated. They also have raised with me around the changes to the exceptional teaching arrangements, that now a medical certificate has to be provided to be able to get that. Now, as somebody who is working with people coming in, trying to get PIPs forms and all that, we know that that service is no longer provided uh, through uh, GPs, or it has to be a CAMS referral. Um, um, but this is for behavioural issues, mm -hmm. and they're expected to have a medical referral. Um, this, this could be a child who is violent, 
um, they're then maybe being directed towards EOTIS, which is full, again in my city, full. Um, they're being taxied outside of the town to somewhere else. Um, so there's nowhere for them to go, so they're brought back under the skull. The skull is not supported and they're not, uh, they're not suitable then, because of this change, they're not suitable under educational teaching arrangements. So there's a lot of frustration out there. I think last week what came out of the committee is just the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, I've probably taken up too much time, but no, that's no. just some of the issues that, that, you know, we'll be raising next week with the Minister. But very much what Daniel said, the department needs to step in. Um, you're talking about being held to account, the EA being held to account. Um, we need to be ensured in the future that that is going to happen. Um, because a lot of this stuff has been going on for many, many years. Okay. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Karen. Uh, can I bring Catherine Kelly in? Thank you, Ricky and Sharon. Um, I think that um, it's very welcome to hear that there's going to be strength and cooperation between the Department of Education and Health. Um, I think Karen. that this is the only way forward um, for us to ensure that the assessment process takes into account the whole needs of the child. Um, and I think that, and I particularly welcome um, the fact that EA are, will be required to listen to the child. Um, but, Ricky, you talked about um, recommendations that you'd be bringing to the EA, um, and one of them, I believe, should be that the parents' views are also listened to. Yeah. Um, in some cases, they are the only voice that a child with special educational needs has. Um, so it's just it's a point more so than a question um, and just to urge you to do that. Well in the new personal learning plan there's four templates for nursery, primary, post primary and special and there's special section and sections in that for the child's views and the parents' views mm. and that's that's replacing the individual education plan and that'll be looked specifically for the child and their development in the school. So yeah. that's in that. Mm. Okay. Rabbi? Thank you, Fisher. Yes, man. Chris doesn't <laughs> smile when he gives me the question. He scares at me. Thank you, guys. You seem to be a permanent fixer, Rudy. Okay? Uh, thank you. Oh, like an MLA. <laughs> you dodge your questions better. <laughs> um, so, you don't really. Thanks for your help, guys, in this. And this it's, it's, a, it's an incredible time that you find yourselves in, given the, how things have ramped up recently and, and, and how facts have at last come to the surface. But I actually think that'll help drive change. <laughs> might mean that we're not caught in a 10-year hiatus. Um, so look forward to what's going to be done in the future. But I do have um, two hopefully pertinent questions and sorry again if we're going over old ground. But, and Daniel sort of touched on it and you talked about having that scrutiny on EA. So the first question um, is with regard to that piece of work that's going to be done between the share, for the sharing of information between the Health Service Trust and EA. And my difficulty here is that um, you've got an encompass coming in. That's uh, about a, the, the full implementation of that across the, the, the health service will be probably three, four, five years. Okay, so you've got staff training issues there. We've got EA who have cultural problems, difficulties, and a malay with using their own technology. I know it's a capita or capital one, whatever that's called, but that's not the issue. It's actually the fact that the simple databases, individual databases, are being used to store information and it's not being transferred across. So just what what. Um, confidence would you have that it's it's not just an IT issue? It's, it's not. It's, it's, I mean, it's not. Sharon, you can jump in. It, it goes. It does go goes well. It goes much deeper. Yeah. So there's a problem to fix now, which is done by changing the culture. I get that, but ensuring that that's a robust fix, because it must be harder to get that link in. Because there's a different culture in the health service. I worked on it for a long time mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, w what we're finding is, as there was with the previous legacy education boards. There's a difference of approach across the health and social care trusts. So part of our work through the, the SEND steering group that I jointly chair with the senior official in health has been to make sure that all the trusts are on the same page in terms of their requirements to comply with requests from the EA. So part of that work has been, is there a central point of contact within each trust? There has to be, and we want that to there continue. Is. Mm -hmm. There is at the minute, and we want that to continue when this uh, legislation comes into play. Um, are there standard templates that are used to request the advice from each trust so they're not uh, taking different approaches? And we've got standard templates in place for some of us now. And then secondly, is there electronic sharing of that information um, to speed up the process? Uh, the electronic solution is more complicated, as IT issues normally are. 
Um, this is sensitive personal information in relation to children's needs. Uh, under GDPR, it's therefore a sensitive category of data, uh, and we need to have assurance that when requests are made and information is sent back, that it is going to be done securely. So work on that piece continues, um, and we hope to have a solution to that within the next three to six months. So there are, there are a range of things that go beyond IT. And, and, and this is, I'm going to just say this, it's not a question perhaps, it's just it's so complex because I know have, I chair the uh, APG on ADHD, for instance, and we had the five trusts in front of us given evidence and asking questions at one stage, and the, the difference in terms of the attitude, the difference in terms of their gateways, their difference in terms of their approach, their difference in their terms to making awards, and, mm -hmm. and that was, was incredible. So, so, so that there's a, even before you guys would even get the information, and this, the safeguarding, safeguarding use of it is incredible, so there's a bigger, bigger piece of work to be done there. Um, so this is just the final question. Uh, so regarding, so we talk about uh, in this uh, this new act there, uh, and the regarding greater access and rights to children, um, and and hearing the children's voice, how will those with communication disabilities be supported? Um, what does that look like, and um, and who will be charged with um, initiating extra support that might be required? Well, in the regulations, uh, when you see them, um, you'll see that we've put in specific uh, ways we put in. Um, an alternative person we've also put in for the parent um, you know so there are a number of things within the regulations to allow the voice of the child uh, to be heard uh, I've been with children myself in the um, consultation on the regulations and uh, there are different ways of allowing them to communicate sometimes there will have to be someone else there to help with that alternative person um, so that's covered in the regulations. That will be something you'll be interested in when we start to talk about the detail, um, whether you think that we've put enough in. Um, and, and, and the response, the owner, basically the responsible owner for the person to decide if that extra help is required or available yeah. and, and, and how that's so. Absolutely. And then there's also children over 16 with statements will have their own rights if they have mm -hmm. capacity. If they lack capacity, then who, who takes that decision? So that's all covered in the detail of the regulations. That's something mm -hmm. that I think you'll want to pour over. It's a very important area. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Justin McBilty. Thank you, Reggie. Thank you, Sharon, um, for coming before coming. It was difficult in the circumstances, especially in the context of the failures that we've all become um, aware of over the last uh, number of weeks. Um, just very briefly, what is going to be different in terms of how you hold the Education Authority to account? I think there's a very specific piece of work here that uh, is now underway within the EA in terms of its improvement plan, which Kim mentioned, uh, in terms of the issues which the Chief Executive has uh, already covered. It will be important that the department has in place an appropriate oversight uh, response, which we can take assurance from that everything is happening as it should. So what that looks like at this point in time, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but we have had a preliminary conversation with the chief executive yesterday about that. Uh, so we will be following up uh, and we'll be making sure that uh, we are fully cited on everything in terms of what's happening, where it's happening and what the progress of that is. No chance you'd have to wait for a whistleblower to find out anything. Well, whistleblowers, uh, I can't comment. I mean, there may be further whistleblowers. I have no idea. Uh, but in terms of what we know now, um, it's important that that work is delivered and that we have sight of it. And that will be my intention. There will be clear lines of accountability. There, there are clear lines of accountability. Uh, and there will continue to be clear lines of accountability. There are clear lines of accountability and there were clear lines of accountability. Who is accountable? There are governance and accountability mechanisms in place uh, through a review which happens uh, regularly throughout the year, governance and accountability review meeting, which is chaired by the Permanent Secretary uh, and which is attended by the EA Chair and the EA Chief Executive and other senior officials from both sides of that organisation. So I expect that that meeting from this point on will have a heavy focus on SEN issues along with everything else that it looks at in terms of accountability and governance. So there will be an establishment of who has been accountable for the failures to date? 
uh, I, I, I'm not involved in that process, that GAR process, which I've just set out. So that might be a question for others to answer. Okay, thank you. Okay. It's Justin. Okay. Officials, thanks very much indeed. Um, obviously, there are wider questions there for the Minister. We've invited the Minister, we've invited the Education Authority Board Chair, Education Authority Board Audit Subcommittee Chair, and the Education Authority Board <coughs> Children and Young People Services uh, Subcommittee Chair as well. But the responding to the feelings in relation to SEM provision um, by way of a vastly improved SEM framework is obviously an important task. And the committee looks forward to playing its role and contributing toward that. So mm -hmm. thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thanks. Okay, ah. members, if I could ask the clerk to summarise actions uh, further to those two oral briefings we've received today. So, Chair, in terms of the first briefing, then, if the committee agrees and they are content then to write to the Education Authority seeking um, information on the reasons underpinning the increase in uh, enrolments in special schools, Kim said, should we come back on that? Also seeking sight of the staff formula and uh, perhaps also seeking sight of their contingency plans in respect of coronavirus because they said they were developing them. Um, additionally, uh, to ask for sight of the, the Dr Hunter report and also information as to how the Education Authority is to make use of the Carpenter report, the Rushford report and the experience in other jurisdictions in respect of special schools uh, and perhaps also to give some clarity around um, restraint and restrictive practice and the policy in that regard. And then for the department, so that first briefing, I haven't missed anything. I haven't missed anything. No. Can I ask if we can get, because um, I don't think I was answered, the plan around effective training that the schools are paying for at the minute, but if EA, um, what's their plan to uh, provide that training or the funding for that training? Um, uh, the plan around workforce, um, uh, the, the, the range of therapists and that that was mentioned, and the flexibility and different types of staff, and a plan around accommodation needs and the future. Um, because it, we're just mentioning funds was already on SEP and capital, but this is ongoing on a yearly basis for all the schools. Chairperson, in addition, then we're writing to the department, as well as I think as a member of said, we're writing to the department, asking him about the school enhancement program. Um, there was just a reference made that there, it can't be used for new health provision, and just to get clarification about that, and also on the average time scales um, for uh, SEP um, uh, projects to, to work through. Mm -hmm. Also asking the department about the schedule of accommodation, why there isn't one, and uh, you know what the, what it means for mainstream schools, and to compare and contrast. And also then to ask them about uh, joined upness with health, um, what they're doing in respect of the uh, children's support. Um, uh, CSC Act, um, because although that hasn't been um, the the relevant policy has been developed by the department, hasn't been adopted by the executive. Thus, the um, annual re uh, report on cooperation isn't being produced. Um, but there's still nothing to stop them producing such a report. <coughs> and also, just seeking clarity around the absence of a direct a referral system, as uh, was indicated there that the um, okay um, that. Um, there is no direct feral system for special schools and they have to go back to GPs just for clarification about that and what perhaps they're doing in that regard. So members were happy with that. Then we'll move to the second briefing. So writing to the department, um, just seeking clarity from the department around the consequences for the Education Authority and indeed for Health and Social Care Trusts in the event of non-compliance with statutory timescales. So currently there is non-compliance. It's not clear what the consequences are. So there will be new, new timescales, but what will be the consequences? Um, additionally, then, um, seeking just information on the statutory um, assessment uh, timescales in other jurisdictions, mm. and then um, just sight of DE's communications recommendations. This is around the sand lever journey about communications for the EA with parents, uh, SENCOs and schools, and also their plans around uh, electronic sharing. I think the member did get an answer, but anyway, we could ask just for clarification around the time scales for commencement and indeed consultation. And then if we're happy with that, then we'd also write to the Education Authority, just uh, picking up the point which uh, Deputy Chair made, seeking clarification around the 
um, ASD policy, which is apparently under review, and uh, the inconsistency issues at Key Stage 4 and other points, and also around um, just clarification around changes to the exceptional teaching arrangements. Yeah, thank you. And if that is. Just one turn, maybe a piece of research rather than uh, to inform us. Are, are there any jurisdictions in which uh, special needs and needs schools? and share campuses uh, together? Which, sorry, uh, uh, mainstream schools and special schools? Yep. Yes. Share campuses. Yes, Scotland. The committee visited one uh, a couple of years ago. And I think also Stroul, uh, because you've got Arverley on the one That's campus. Right. So they are, uh, we visited a school, Catholic school, controlled school, special school, just outside Glasgow. Yeah. And they all sort of did things in, in the special school. You know what I mean? The kids all did stuff, so it was... Uh, okay. So it certainly does help. If that, hope that helps answer the member. Sorry, Chairperson, that's all, I think. Okay, members agreed with those actions. Great. Members, if I could propose and retain at least five of us to process correspondence, we will forecast forward work programme into next week's forward work programme, so this should be uh, achievable very promptly. Clark, are you willing to speak to the correspondence for us, please? Chairperson, I propose we, we cheat a bit here. Uh, what I would suggest members do is, where, where in my index has indicated that uh, members note, we note, yeah. where it says something else, we don't, and I'll just put it into next week's um, pack. Okay. So if they're content to do yep. that. Okay. okay. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. And then forward work programme. I think Talk best that we give week. yeah we give that the attention that it's due and we make sure diary arrangements align with what we're proposing and therefore I will uh, date any other business. No, okay then the uh, our next meeting will be Wednesday the 18th of March 9:45 in the Senate Chamber at Parliament Buildings and that will be a joint meeting with the Committee of Economy. Um, in relation to the 14 to 19 strategy. Can I then ask that the committee meeting does now adjourn? Yeah. Agreed.